in Ethiopia, is that right? Well, I wouldn't call it Ethiopia in the first place because uh, it is Eritrea, clearly. Uh, and uh, the Eritreans never accept that they are Ethiopians. And it is very uh, unrealistic to say it is Ethiopia in the mm. first place. Yeah. Yes, that's, I'm sure, something we're going to come on to very briefly uh, in, in the latter part of the program. Tell me this, in your, uh, in your press release you also said um, we need action now, there's no time to waste. Do you think we're going to see action to, to, to deal with the kind of problem that you raised in your press release? In the first place I hope that there will be action, provided that um, the media also correctly put it right to, to the uh, international uh, community. Uh, we've seen it in 1984 when the first starvation came into being in Eritrea. There was no news at all, but this time I think we have, less, we have learned from uh, our uh, experience and we have uh, brought the early warning system uh, starting from uh, September actually, before the uh, WFP, uh, which is the WFP, which is what? Uh, World Food Program. Uh, from Addis Ababa was uh, talking about 1.5 million Eritreans may starve this year. But they have talked uh, about the Eritreans who are in the hands of the uh, dirt. Uh, they haven't seen the That's other the side. That's the Ethiopian government. That's right. right, yes. They haven't seen the, the other side of the, of the uh, problem, whereby they are all, uh, majority of the people, which is the majority of the land is also liberated by the EPLF. Uh, I would say 85 percent uh, and majority of the Eritrean people also live in the rural area. In that case, they are majority within the uh, control of the EKLF. So one can say that if the majority of the people are in the liberated area, then there are more than 1.5 million people starving in Eritrea, uh, will be starving in Eritrea in, in that case, 1990. You mentioned the media. Uh, and the need for getting your message across in the media. Charles Stewart, you are, in a sense, a man of the media. Are we uh, about to see once again pictures of starving children on News at 10 from Ethiopia? Well, <coughs> the, the, um, now, there have been changes since 1984. The, the world is much more aware of Ethiopia and more aware of the problems. And the information... Uh, is early enough now for something to be possible. And uh, <coughs> if what, the what did you see when you were in Ethiopia that, that would be that would perhaps be different now? Well, I think when we first arrived in Ethiopia in 1983, the nobody seemed to be very concerned. I mean, they seemed to think that Ethiopia always had a deficit of food and that uh, starvation and hunger were endemic and that uh, people would die. I mean, when we uh, first talked in Addis Ababa of the need to make a program to generate money and to uh, alert the uh, public to what was happening, uh, the, there wasn't, there were, people were saying really that, that there wasn't any need, that there was enough money, and uh, in Ethiopia there was enough money available and the problems weren't financial, the problems were in getting food to people. What, Im what impression did you get then of, of, of the kinds of problems that that led to? Well, for a country as poor as Ethiopia with a, poor in, with a very poor infrastructure, the problem is getting food into where it's needed. So uh, even if food is in the ports, it can take three months to get it to, to the people that need the food. Uh, the roads are uh, very, very poor, um, very few roads are tarmac. Uh, heavy lorries carrying food will run through a set of tyres that would uh, last for a year in, in, on European roads. They'll only last for, for a month. Uh, so so the, the problems of moving, transporting food are very, very much different and very much more difficult than they would be anywhere else. Abadi Zemo, let me move on to you. This <coughs> famine uh, that we're being warned of will, I think, affect your area, Tigray, uh, as much as Eritrea. Is that right? Yeah. Well, actually, 
the number of people affected in the area in Tigray is uh, a bit higher than uh, what uh, my colleague from Eritrea uh, mentioned it. There are uh, currently uh, uh, 2.5 million people affected because of the uh, current uh, famine crisis. More people in yeah. Tigray than, yeah. than in Eritrea. Yeah. What, what kind of problems is that going well, to lead uh, to in Tigray? Actually, uh, there are fundamental problems. Uh, the development itself, you know, there has never been uh, given due attention by the central government towards the development of the area. Then, you know, if there is a climatic change in whatsoever condition, uh, immediately, you know, famine is uh, really felt by in the, I mean, in the area. Then now, you know, uh, the uh, rain, uh, the rose rain fell. And in certain areas, about 90% of the crop uh, did uh, fail. So you that's, why, that's why now we are having this uh, crisis. Yeah. I thought the story that we were being told in 1988 was the, in fact that the, the, the harvest had done very well. Well, yeah, yeah, in certain places, yes, but uh, not in all parts of Tigray. And so what kind of problems do you perceive that's going to lead to in Tigray? Now, you know, the, since the, uh, there are this uh, big number of population affected by the famine, unless you know, an uh, immediate uh, supply goes to the area, what we are going to witness, you know, more or less similar to the situation of 1984-85. We are expecting more people to be internally displaced. We are expecting more people to come to the western part of Tigray and then to the Sudan. This is always you not know, a tragedy. Unless you now dying uh, children are seen in the screen, uh, the response always has been very late and not also adequate. Then, you know, in the event of this, what we will see is you now a lot of people dying, a lot of people moving out of their home villages. Do you think that's inevitable? <coughs> Definitely. Actually, in one of the uh, districts in uh, the eastern part, this is happening. Already, well, Bowden, in certain areas, people have started uh, dying and also moving out of their villages. That's, that's beginning to happen now? Yeah. Definitely. Mark Bowden, your, uh, from Save the Children Fund, to what extent are your people now gearing up to deal with this kind of tragedy? Uh, well, I, I would hope that we're geared up in that I think that the situation in, in Ethiopia uh, and, and Tigray and Eritrea is one that is a recurring situation and I think that part of our strategy has been to try and hold contingency stocks uh, in the country. We, we keep our own transport operation going uh, in case of this eventuality and are extensively involved in trying to manage uh, nutrition surveillance uh, in those areas that we have access to to try and trigger off as early a response as possible. As, as, as Charles will know, we were quite instrumental in getting people to try and take notice of things in Ethiopia in 1983 when people weren't that interested in, in, in listening. So uh, I think that it's, it's something that you're, you're always aware of, but I think that uh, you know, there are very peculiar problems related to Ethiopia, Tigray and Eritrea. I mean, for example, I think that the party hasn't sort of really explained how difficult the logistics are of getting food in, into Tigray because if there aren't uh, corridors of, of peace or whatever you want to call it, if there's not free access from the port, you can't move food in sufficient supplies at no enough stage to cover the needs of the population. I mean, Talk about a, a corridor of peace. What exactly is it, a corridor of peace? Well, it's one of these awful words that people dreamt up, uh, sort of, I think, when... Uh, uh, sort of a UN word really, you know, I mean, it's what it means is free access to areas to distribute relief assistance uh, rather than, than to, uh, that, that guarantees basically the neutrality of relief so that food aid can go through unhindered, not guarded by military convoy to be distributed to the people in need. By, by your people? Well, whoever. I mean, I don't think we'd, we'd sort of claim any special right to it. I mean, it might be the ICRC, it might be the UN, it might be some sort of uh, group that has status. I mean, it's so, so can, you, can you just paint for us a picture, if you like, of the kinds of problems that your people would have on the ground at the present time in a place like Tigray? Well, as I said, uh, the, the problem of being operational for uh, a charity uh, is, is extremely difficult in, in Tigray uh, or in, in Ethiopia. Why? Because I think that it's uh, a war that is not officially recognised. I mean, we don't have the same status as, say, the International Committee of the Red Cross would have. So that if we uh, work in Tigray as an operational agency openly, we jeopardise our work in Ethiopia. It's a discussion that I mean, Abadi and I have had over many years. It's not a, not a sort of 
uh, new debate, but it, 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 you know you are threatening issues of national sovereignty by by working in both sides. It's not recognised. We don't have a remit to do it, nor does Oxfam. Uh, none of the the agencies have it. it. It's a problem that affects us, I think, in many parts of Africa. That uh, you know there are wars that are long standing, long running. Not you know. Forgive us. We've obviously lost uh, some lights for a moment, but I think we'll 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 get them back in a moment. We'll continue in the semi darkness and, uh, <laughs> and so. Um, let's. Uh, let, let, me, let me, if I may, move on to, to Mary Dines at that moment. Mary, listening to what Mark was saying there, is it, uh, is it a familiar story? Is it something...? Well, it, it is the same story, only it's rather worse now. And I think when you ask Charles Stewart what was different now, um, there are some things that are very different from the previous famine. One is that the writ of the uh, Ethiopian government does no longer runs in Tigray anywhere. So therefore, any operation to save Tigray and people through the Derg is bound to be a failure. And it's ironic, I think, that the United Nations is sitting waiting for the Ethiopian government to ask them to do it, because it is really ridiculous, because they, they don't actually have anybody left in, in Tigray. And it's also true to a lesser extent in Eritrea, where they're only in the big towns. And to talk about mounting relief operations to the, the rural populations in either of those two places is totally unrealistic. Through totally the dark, unrealistic. Through the dark, yes, it is. So, so how, how then can aid be brought to the Well, they the could only population? do it, and I understand the Save the Children Fund's problem, but they can only do it through the people who operate there, which is the Relief Society of Tigray and the Eritrean Relief Association. It, of course, is much harder to do it because you have to use Port Sudan and get food in through Sudan, but given the will, they can do it. And the dilemma is the sort of status of the Ethiopian government. You know, does it really exist in this situation? I'm afraid at the moment it doesn't. It really Peace isn't Bell, able to do it. It's a, it's a very difficult and complex problem we're hearing about here. Is there a better way? Well, what we hear, and it's extremely interesting what we said here before, um, uh, the first point which I'd like to make, make this crystal clear, that well, I'm thinking primarily in the first instance, to begin with, the starting point, about official aid. Make quite clear, uh, this was what we've heard here, particularly from Mary just now, is that uh, it's so clear that official aid does not go to the pathetic figures we see in the propaganda of the aid lobbies, it goes to the governments, to their rulers, mm -hmm. and quite often, in fact, very generally, not generally, but very often, I want to be careful, it is the rulers who are responsible for the gruesome conditions which we see rightly reported by Charles Stewart, Mary Dines, and others. Therefore, it is a, a great mistake a basic mistake to identify the rulers with the people. And it is crystal clear, it should be, that the a official aid does not go to the pitiable, pathetic figures which, who we see in the propaganda of the official aid lobbies. Who does it go to then? It goes to the governments, to their rulers. And that is quite different. I that do. is quite different. And quite often it's those rulers who are responsible, or largely responsible, for the gruesome conditions in which people live. The drought in itself, I don't think, explains the conditions in Ethiopia. A country I don't know well. I know the Sudan, re the Sudan reasonably well. Ethiopia I know only very superficially. But what I do know is that drought itself need not cause such misery if there is a smoothly functioning trading system, because then there are reserve stocks and also international and, and long distance trading links. But if you, if you destroy the trading system and the trading links, there are no reserve stocks and any drought causes or any other calamity causes the utmost, utmost misery. And it's 
also, I mean, I'm still thinking very much of official aid, not of the o o work of uh, organizations like Mark Bowden. You f um, I was in the southern Sudan in 1983, before the very big famine of 84-85. There were by then over 700,000 refugees in the southern Sudan, mostly from Ethiopia, others from uh, Uganda, Chad, and Zaire. That's before the big famine. So there are sort of political forces at work here which have nothing to do with the drought. Mm. I could de develop this, but I don't want to hog the discussion, so I hand it over to somebody else. Richard? I think the, the first thing one has to understand is that the government of Ethiopia is recognized by the Organization of African Unity as being the government of all of that territory on your map. If you'd like to hold it up just briefly, John, it illustrates, the first problem is illustrated by the fact that if you see Eritrea is actually the rest of Ethiopia's access to the sea. Without Eritrea it would be a landlocked country. The second problem um, that exists there is quite clearly that there is a conflict of culture in that part of Africa. You see it between the Amharic ascendancy in Addis and the much more Arabian tradition of Eritrea. You see it next door in the Sudan, where the north of the Sudan is landlocked in a fight with the south of the Sudan. Like Peter, I've also been in the Sudan many times and in Ethiopia a few times. But all of this is also fueled because the west and the east, in the shape of the two major power blocks, have made it possible to keep the wars going there. Now what I think is the major hope at the moment is the initiative of ex-president Jimmy Carter in trying to promote peace. And the second initiative which I welcome has been the Gorbachev initiative of disengagement from regional conflict. Those two initiatives do offer some hope. Otherwise, you see, if you look at that map, you've got the Sudan. Now in the southern Sudan, you've got General John Garang. His headquarters are actually inside Ethiopia. In the north of Ethiopia, you've got Eritrea and Tigray, and I'm sure our colleagues here will not disagree if I say that it is basically the Sudan that permits access. In other words, you've got a regional conflict, which in my view is, has been exacerbated over many years by the activities of different competing powers that have actually been fighting a war by proxy. The good thing about the Carter Initiative, which is basically to get talks going, is that it might offer a way out. There's no way out in dominating Eritrea from Addis, but I also do not think that a way out is to be had by dismembering the country. And in saying that, you know, one has to realize that once you start fiddling with the borders of African states, bad a job as they may have done at the Berlin Congress in the 1880s, once you start fiddling with the borders, you've got a whole witch's cauldron. L let me ask you this, Richard. I, 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 I don't want to, well, I, I will paraphrase uh, um, Peter, Peter Bauer's views, and I'm sure he'll correct me if I get it wrong, but I get the impression that he sometimes thinks that actually provision of aid is largely responsible for some of those kind of conflicts, that are very complex conflicts that you were describing there. I mean, do you feel that's true? We always think of aid as being bags of flour, don't we? And of course the leadership of the country can't eat all the bags of flowers. But of course aid is far more complex. You see, up until certainly late 76, the principal source of military equipment for the Ethiopian government, the DERG, the military leadership, was actually the United States of America. It was only in the middle to late 70s that they switched, after arguments, from drawing on the American military sources to drawing on principally Soviet military sources. Now, at the same time, roughly the same switch in reverse happened on the other side, because the Soviet Union used to back Eritrea when it was convenient for it to do so, quite frankly. It then withdrew, it then withdrew its support. So the Soviet Union has switched sides, and basically the West has switched sides. No, you, you well, I mean, that is just not a factual statement, that the Soviet Union was not backing Eritrea with arms. Where the Soviet Union switched sides was from Somalia to Ethiopia. They were in Somalia supporting some, the Somalis, and then the Americans went to Somalia from Addis, <laughs> the, the, the Russians went 
to Addison and Mogadishu. It's totally untrue to say that they were actually involved in the war in Eritrea. Oh, and they never, they may have psychologically thought, you know, this was a revolutionary organization. They haven't done much to prove their support, have they? Not but they certainly not, but didn't. They certainly you can't compare the two things. It's, it's totally the, unrealistic. The first lobbying I received from it on the Eritrean subject was Afri actually from Eastern European embassy sources. I'm not saying that that's wrong. Mm. Let yeah, me say, I'm you're, just you're in, pointing you're, out where it came from. Yes, but you're implying that they fed the war, and that certainly is not true. They were not, in fact, giving arms to the Arab I think. Are, are we going to certainly come on to, to yes. a, a very substantial discussion, I'm sure, about the, the geopolitics of, of, of the whole Arab business later on? But Peter, can but I... What I to say, I, this was your first to me of a minute or two ago. Well, I was going to invite well, you to, to tell us where, if you thought yeah, I'd come No, support. what I wanted to say is that uh, official aid which goes to governments, this is the first thing to understand, that's what official aid goes to, um, increases the stakes in the fight for power Be because it, it enhances the resources, the power and the privileges of the government and therefore this has nothing to do with my own political position. It simply it, 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 it simply e enhances political tension because it becomes more important who has the government and that is critical and it's uh, it is but I think this is a starting point of a discussion really on on the effects of official aid now we heard from Mark Bowden about the difficulties the state of uh, uh, Save the Children Fund has in getting supplies through and the, and the infrastructure, neglect of the infrastructure. Between 1983 and 86, the Ethiopian government received two and a half billion dollars of official aid. What happened to the money? Where well, is it going? Rural, I said, I where think, did uh, it go? Rural electric. Well, I just wanted to one thing that you might say it did go on. Well, it certainly didn't go. It certainly did nothing yeah. to help the poorest. I suspect, well, I, as I, I say, I, I haven't been to Ethiopia, but I have been to southern Sudan, uh, and I got a kind of feel of, of, of what went on because some of these things are the same in the southern Sudan. Somebody here already referred to the conflict between the Arab, domin Arab Muslim dominated north and the black. Christian and enemy south in in the Sudan, but again I don't want to focus discussion. Yeah, well I I'm, I'm sort of some perplexed by some of the arguments. I, I mean, taking one of Professor Bauer's earlier points about the market, I, I find markets certainly in Ethiopia quite perplexing because certainly my recollection in '74 was that a lot of uh, of the suggestion. I mean, one could argue. I don't know whether one would argue in 74 that Ethiopia had a free market or not in, in the Emperor's time. But uh, that certainly a lot of the problems in the 74 famine were due to very significant price rises due to hoarding. And, and, and really the famine in some sense in 74 could be seen to be the fear of an escalation of prices and, and people actually throwing themselves onto the mercy uh, of the roadside town. I, I mean, I... <laughs> I confess to having worked on both sides of the house, I mean having worked for the British government on the aid side as well as for an NGO and I'm actually a lot happier on the NGO. NGO. Non-governmental organisation, sorry, charity. Uh, I mean I worked for Save the Children Fund for the last 11 years but I certainly don't think a lot of what we can do can be done without so-called official assistance uh, because of the scale of the problems. I mean we can't mobilise the sorts of resources that are required. I mean it is actually beyond our remit and it's beyond... Sorry, official assistance from who? Well, from, from bilateral donors, I mean, be it the British, the Americans, the Russians, or, or whatever. I mean, we haven't got those sorts of resources. I mean, we have about uh, 50 million pounds uh, a year, which is, you know, doesn't go very far, uh, either in terms of, of buying food or in moving food. Uh, let me ask Peter Bauer, let me try and focus this down uh, a little, Peter. Uh, you're, you're, you said you didn't want to go into your political views, as it were. In a sense, I think your political views are perhaps very interesting in this, this respect. I mean, if I understand you correctly, you believe that, that countries like Ethiopia would be better off if there were less, perhaps even no, direct government aid, but uh, a much 
broader development of the free market. Is that is that a fair? I would say it would. Pro this is pro is a, put it this way, encapsulate. It's a it's oversimplifies because I certainly don't believe the free, free so-called free market is a solution for everything. But I do think that the politicization of life, promoted by, promoted by official aid exacerbate certain problems. For example, look, the climate of northern Nigeria is not all that different from Sahel. A bit different, but not all that different. I know that country fairly well. I, I mean Nigeria. You don't hear of famines there because there has been no destruction of the trading system. And people have reserve stocks and trading links. And that's why a drought doesn't have the same catastrophic consequences, the same misery as I think it has in, Ethi as in Ethiopia. Although I want to repeat that I do not know that country at all well, although as it happens I have been there. And I have been there also on the ground some years ago. <coughs> so I'd, I think the turn A to refer to government-to-government -government wealth transfers, I'm not talking of official aid, I repeat that, talking of official aid, to refer to government-to-government -government wealth transfers as aid disarms all criticism, prejudges results, and obscures realities. If one refers to them as government-to-government -government subsidies or government-to-government -government transfers, instead of aid, the whole idea would lose much of its emotional appeal. And one could try and discuss it coolly, the pros and cons, but the moment you call it aid, you prejudge the results, disarmed, and disarmed criticism. And therefore the aid, the supporters of official aid, can claim a monopoly of compassion. This, this idea of a monopoly of compassion is very important. They can then describe a character like myself, or people who think as I do, as bigoted, uh, ignorant, and insensitive. Surely well, it depends on what the uh, aid is. Because, I mean, <laughs> aid is stretched from being helicopters for the Indian Air Force, which is certainly a government to government wealth transfer with uh, various subplots in mind to food aid. I think that one of the difficulties is the British aid program which has been successively cut to a point where we now actually import more hard currency from the third world as a whole than we give to it, that the British aid program has been too indirectly applied and that really we need to look at the, pro the philosophy followed by some of the European countries, particularly the Dutch, with their like-minded group which actually tries and often actually distributes official aid via the voluntary agencies themselves on the grounds that these voluntary agencies that are actually on the ground can fine-tune the aid in much better. I was not so long ago, I was in Bangladesh three or four years ago, the finance minister of Bangladesh actually informed me, he said well of course our aid transfers in are part of our import of foreign currency and frankly it doesn't matter how they get there. So to that point, Peter, you were right. But I think also we have to look at aid and try and work out what it's supposed to do and try and fine-tune it much more. And there you can use government resources through voluntary agencies often much more effectively than the government-to-government -government transfer. I would, say, I would like to, to say that government-to-government -government aid, I mean, by definition, goes to governments, whether it's helicopters or food. Now, I'm on record, contrary to people who think of me such as a hardliner, I'm on record for at least 12 years wanting to enhance the role of the of voluntary agencies. I have more reservations now about this than I had 12 years ago, but I believe the voluntary aid is the only way of reaching the poorest in these countries. Actually, no, there are certain points that have to be clarified. Uh, one is, for example, if we take Tigray, there are people who are in need of support. 
and the people as Mary has mentioned it, uh, almost the whole part of Tigray, so actually totally the whole part of Tigray is under the direct administration of the Tigray People's Liberation Front, TPLN. Now there are people who are in need of support. Is it because of lack of infrastructure that these people are not supported? No. The infrastructure is there. There is a possibility to support these people. But some of the agents, actually I can say most of the agencies, most of the governments, since they are looking at the aid or the donation that they think they could give, are looking at politically, then there is a hindrance to directly support the people who are in need of this support. Otherwise, as Mark mentioned, it, it is not because of lack of infrastructure that the people of Tigray, and for that matter the people of Eritrea, are not getting what you know the international community feels that you know, these people should get. It is due to the political uh, decision of the different NGOs non-government agencies, and at the same time, the government. You say it's due so, to the political decision. Right? Yes, exactly. Because What political decision, yeah. precisely? If, you know, the agencies, in name, or governments, who are saying in name that, you know, they are trying to give some sort of support to the people because they are poor, or because they are victimized by the man-made and natural calamity, that's, you know, purely or humanitarian ground, then directly and logically, the people of Tigray and the people of Eritrea should be the ones you know, who could benefit directly from this support. But since this is not the real analysis, since this is not the real intention of most of the angels, almost all the governments, they refer to give this assistance when you know in reality they know that it is not the Ethiopian government which could have the access to the people of Eritrea. What the people the, of Tigray. What is they, the real motive then? Yes, it is a political mo uh, motive because they have, you know, the uh, tendency to uh, please the Ethiopian government, to win over the Ethiopian <coughs> government to their side, and then you know they pour all the support they give to Ethiopia to the Ethiopian government. When in reality so they are aware of, they are aware of that you now the Ethiopian government is not first keen in support of these people. Two, is not in a position to even support these people. It doesn't have the access. Why the don't people, you give it the, the people, yeah, the people could, the that. people could, the people could be supported, only supported, <coughs> if aid is channeled through the relief site of Tigray, through the Eritrean Relief Association. It's only this channel, which is available to those people to be supported. Then, who is now hindering the, this support to reach the, the people? You are. This is not the case. Saying we are not. Come. We are not. We are not hindering any support from reaching the people. In reality, what we are saying, you know, look, you know, there are people who are not administered by the Ethiopian government. The Ethiopian government, in reality, is not also interested in helping them. But we are, we are in a position to help these people. If you don't help these people, the consequence is starvation to death. The consequence is migration to the different areas, the neighboring countries, as it, is, it was seen in 1984. Why didn't, at that time, the Ethiopian government really support these people? Over, at that time, we had over 700,000, actually, 700,000 Tigrans who have been displaced, who have been internally displaced from their home villages. But at that time, what was the government's policy? The government's policy was you not know, to force people to, to be taken, I mean, to take these people by force, you know, to a so-called resettlement program, which actually the intention was a political intention to weaken the yeah. people in the area, and at the same time to weaken those people who were in the south or who are in the south, the inhabitants. It was a political motive. Then, you know, this was this not known to those agencies who advocate that aid should be channeled to the Ethiopian government. It was obvious. It was obvious to the agencies. Because they were aware that you now this resettlement program was done by force. And it, it was always to the agencies, to the governments. And that the Ethiopian government to give aid, official aid, to the Ethiopian government throughout this. Yes. It was and always, you know, for, 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 for every agency. In, in, in 1984, in that famine <coughs> period, two thirds of the aid that came into Ethiopia was not handled by the Ethiopian government. The Ethiopian government had set up in 
After the 1974 famine, they had set up a relief commission to coordinate and handle aid. <coughs> and this was the, one of the largest organizations in the country, actually, and, and uh, was, uh, uh, had the infrastructure to deal with the aid. But uh, governments, uh, particularly the American government, uh, would not deal with the Ethiopian government at all. And the Ethiopian government stepped aside and allowed the food to come in, and agencies, CARE and uh, other agencies, handled all the aid that came in. So the American uh, government, which was the largest donor, did not operate through the Ethi Ethiopian government at all. Um, so in that way, the official aid disenfranchised the, the government. So the government were, were bypassed and the Ethiopian government only had it available to uh, feed the people about one third of the aid that came in. And this was, and the Ethiopians uh, ha had to have an open book so that any aid that came in was accounted for, so that any government or any organization that gave aid could see where it, where it went, how it went, and how quickly it went. So the problem, I mean, it, the problem in 84 was that there wasn't any food in the country. I mean, there clearly just wasn't any. For many people moved and were and had to leave their homes and died because there was no food I would available. Say, uh, the, the problem in, in that region is perhaps the war. We're talking about yeah. most of the time well, Clearly the war. I mean, if the war, food if, to people. If, if the war was not there, then things would not be, wouldn't, wouldn't have been like this. It would be entirely different. It, it would have been entirely different. Uh, you put it right now. Um, so, governments and even NGOs or the international organizations like ICRC or any other UN uh, organizations are ignoring this matter. Perhaps Richard have mentioned about the uh, Atlanta uh, and uh, Carter initiative to solve the problem in Eritrea peacefully. It is starting now, okay? We will hope that things will be all right at the end of the day. But we are called off whenever there is a problem of famine rather than because there was a problem of there is a problem of war and what can we do to solve it? Say in this type of problems, it's always I myself has been called the time during nineteen eighty seven, for example, on the television to talk about this, or the journalist uh, asks about, about it when it is famine. Why? And it, has, it was not being coming that why is the famine happening? Uh, and uh, the people uh, in Eritrea, for example, I would say, they wouldn't have been starved if the war was not there, because people would have engaged themselves purely to, uh, to produce enough for themselves live alone in peace time, even in war time, a lot of things are happening. It doesn't mean anything is, everything is at standstill and nothing is happening and waiting a handout or even food aid uh, from abroad. I mean, we're not entirely uh, looking uh, and forever uh, I think, for I think the, 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 the question of, of, if you like, what is the root cause of famine? Is it drought? or is it war and politics, you know, is something which, which we're, we're going to come on to in a couple of moments. But before we do, Mary, let me ask you, if I may, I think, uh, this question, I think many people find, uh, find it very difficult to understand that uh, Ethiopia is, is a nation in which, in effect, a civil war is taking place. And there's a, an assumption, obviously a false assumption, that if, you, if aid is given to Ethiopia, it is distributed in Ethiopia. Now, can you just... Can you explain a little for us what, what the conditions are really like on the ground in Eritrea, Tigray? Yes, well, <coughs> the conditions is, are that both those places have been at war. At the moment, there is somewhat of a lull in the war because, as probably people know, there was a coup in the Ethiopian army which failed, but certainly has left them with a very difficult situation. There's almost no, no senior officers to run a war. And there was this enormous problem, it is a logistical problem from Sudan, <coughs> there's no question of that. But you see, I think we're all being rather naive, if I may say so, and I would also take up something that you said on this. 
Um, we're assuming, for example, that voluntary agencies have the ability to reach people that other parts don't reach, as it were, um, simply because they're voluntary. But in a country like Ethiopia, you can't actually operate without the authority of the Ethiopian government to have its own policies about who's going to get aid and why. And I would absolutely challenge that the Relief and Rehabilitation Commission is a voluntary agency. The people who run it are party members. So it's very much an official organization. And if you meant that one, I mean, I really don't accept that that's voluntary at all. No, I didn't say it. I said it's a government organization. But, but don't it's rest on... Mm. It is the government mm. relief organization. Yes, but it's not by separate the from the government. Yeah, but don't, don't I so agree with what Mary just yes. said. Because in October 1984, mm. the, uh, the Ethiopian government issued a public statement, which was reported in the British press, on the 4th of October 1984 that they must retain ultimate control right. uh, and that is why when I said a few minutes ago that I in the 70s I was a, a, a record, I have record several times was, uh, about the voluntary organization and I now have more reservations than I had before exactly for the reason which Mary Dine said namely that the distinction isn't as clear now as I thought at the time it would be because the voluntary organizations, the larger ones, can only operate with the consent of the local government. But we're not really looking at the problems of Ethiopia. I mean, we're talking about Eritrea and Tigray as if this was the only problem, and it isn't. I mean, Rebecca will say something about this, but I doubt if there's half a dozen people in Ethiopia who actually support the Derg who are not involved with it. All the people of Ethiopia want to get rid of the Derg. I mean, that's quite clear that they do. Uh, the fact that they have once again, tells the, the Derg, as you keep referring to it, is basically the military committee that yes, runs it's the, the Ethiopian committee. government. This is now supposed to be a civilian government with a party and everything, but in fact, the military are there in sheep's clothing. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. The Derg, the people who are running it, still are. Um, there are, in fact, more than one conflict. We haven't talked about them. Um, there's the conflict with Eritrea over territory. There's a conflict in Tigray, which is over devolution and over the, actually the, the, who is going to govern in Addis itself. There is a further very large conflict which we haven't talked about in the south of Ethiopia where the Aremos are in conflict with the government in Addis Ababa on quite a considerable scale. Who are, who are the Aremos are in fact um, people who live in the south of Ethiopia and these are the areas to which in fact people resettled. Now, I find it impossible to tolerate the thought that, in fact, any voluntary agency or any government would get involved with the sort of uh, population manipulation that took place after the famine. Indeed, it started before. I can remember being in Sudan in 1980 and seeing people coming out of Ethiopia into Sudan in central areas, not in western areas, um, where, in fact, they had been resettled a long while ago, forced down from Tigray and Wallow into Waliga. Tell us something about the resettlement program. What mm. exactly was well, that about? Well, it means, basically, um, taking people from their home areas and putting them into a completely different area of the country. For example, thousands of kilometers apart in some cases. And what was the purpose? Well, the purpose, I feel perfectly sure, was to prevent the conflicts in those areas from being successful. We take a large numbers would, of people out of Tigray uh, and put them in the south. But that's a partisan view of resettlement. I mean, you have to understand a little bit about Ethiopia. Ethiopia has a central spine of highland, and, and about 90% of the population live crowded on this central plateau, when that's surrounded by lowland, which is very sparsely populated. Can, you, can, can you actually demonstrate that for us, Charles, on, on the map? Show us where they are. Through through this area mm. is Highland, roughly, you know, it's a bit it's shaped more like that, yeah? That's Highland. And the majority, by far the majority of the population live in the Highlands. The Highlands are overcrowded, the, the land has been eroded, um, and it is unable to sustain anything like the population living there. In, when the Americans were advising the Ethiopian government, they, they advised the Ethiopian government that they would have to resettle a large proportion of the people in the lowlands. The reason that people live in the highlands is that the highlands are above the mosquito belt, so most people, people in the highlands live uh, free from mosquitoes and free from malaria. 
the lowlands are not free of malaria. So people in the lowlands live in malaric land and suffer from malaria. So, the, so because of that, people have congregated in, up in the highland areas. So the Americans produced this plan when they were in. They advised the Ethiopian government of the day that they should resettle uh, a large number of people. And in 19, uh, and they concluded there was about 3 million people they had to move. And that was assuming, at the time, everybody was assuming the population was 24 million. The census that were done in 1985, I think it was, suggested that there were, uh, that there was about 45 million people in Ethiopia. So the, the all successive governments have seen the need to move people into the lowlands where, where there is rich land which is very uh, well cultivated cultivatable. And, and how exactly has that movement been Why are they not going on their own, Steve? Why are they not going on their own volition? I mean, I find it incredible that we're talking like this, that the Americans in 19-something-something decided that it was right that people should, three million people should be moved from their homes to another part of the country. I mean, this is really colonialism, isn't it? Well, it seems well, obvious. Well, what, 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 I mean, what do you then... Why, no, what, the, what the, business has the well, Americans, is it? Well, the, but they were advising the government, but it, it, look, there's clearly a problem when a farmer is unable in a normal year to get enough to feed himself and his family. And that, when that is happening successively in successive years, then you need to do something about it. And you can argue about what you should do, but there's clearly a need to do something. But forcibly removing no, people well, cannot be the th answer. Th there are certain points that have to be uh, clarified. Now, what we are saying is you no know, resettlement program, maybe we are going mm. to come to villagization. Uh, this and that, you know, these are certain isolated phenomena. But what are the causes for this? And also, you know, from the discussion we are having, we mentioned uh, the drought or the war which, you know, is causing this mm. problem and that problem. Yes, you know, it is an outcome of the war and also the drought. But should we only condemn the war? Should we say, yes, it is because of the war that, you know, these evil things are happening? No. What is the cause for the war? What is the reason why people are fighting? What are the, what are the reasons? Why, you know, in the north, in the south, in the east, in the west, in the center, people are against the present government. There are good reasons. There are basic problems. What are they? Yes. And these are actually what we are mentioning. People could not, you know, act within their own country, could not be looked as equal citizens. People are not in a position to develop their land, to develop their economy, to a stage where they could attain self-sufficiency. People, politically, they are not allowed to participate in the real decision of their own daily life. Somebody, somewhere else, has to decide on behalf of the millions how to tell to the people, how to really think and how to to, to speak and how they should go during even de de their daily life. How is that done? Yes. <coughs> now, if we look at the whole situation in Ethiopia, what do we have? We have a government, a government which is not tolerant to any different opinion, a government with evil policies, with policies which are not popular. If a farmer who is ready to do planting, who is ready to do an agricultural activity, is not assured whether that product belongs to him or not. Because that farmer is told to sell his produce at a given market, at a much more reduced price. He's not allowed to sell it wherever he wants. So, in a sense, you're saying it's a command economy, but am I not right in believing that, that the economy of Ethiopia is being liberalized? Is. Yeah, the, the, the point is, you know, you see, economically, if you go to the countryside, what do we see? As I mentioned earlier, the farmers are not free to sell their products wherever they want. They are told to sell their products at a centralized market, at a mentioned or stated government market, at a much more reduced price. The farmers are not even you know, allowed to buy communities which they want to buy freely in different markets. They are told 
to buy it at certain areas at a much more higher price than the whole initiative is killed. Okay. People, is that farmers changing though? It is not changing. Mm. Farmers are not, you know, <laughs> farmers are not ready or, you know, the, their initiative is being killed by the present government. Not only this policy, but the policy of legalization. We are told by the government it is a process to really improve the life of the people. But how is it going, you know, done? I mean, how is it uh, implemented? Rebecca, it is being is implemented by force. Well, I, by Farmers force. are not, you know, happy about the legalization program. It is, you know, if they don't accept this program, they cannot stay in their areas. You know, the but army, the them. army goes there and, you know, burns the house and forces the farmers to go to a certain place. In fact, very far, very far, to, very far to their uh, farming but land. Then also, you know, the different policies also. Not only this, the tax taxation, which is very heavy. Shouldn't we, for, shouldn't we, shouldn't we say what villagization well, is? I mean, yes, yes. Yeah, well, well, actually, I'm coming to that point. But the point is, you know, instead of, you know, just, you know, saying resettlement and this and that, we have to really address what the real cause of the problem is. Yes, we'll come back to the real it cause in a, a second. We'll yeah. come back to the real cause. Tell us what villagization is. Well, the the countryside in Ethiopia you, is scattered with small settle settlements, maybe five houses, ten houses, fifteen houses, but it's 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 liberally scattered. In, in that way, it was small communities, very small communities. Villagization is pulling these small communities together into um, much larger conurbations, and the notion is that each village, into villages, which would uh, uh, congregate 50 or so of these small villages together. Uh, the idea behind it is to change some of the structural way that the society exists. For instance, um, it will bring a school into, into that village so that people can, children can go to school and don't have long distances to walk. At the moment, in those, these small villages, the uh, school is a remote possibility for most people because each far farmer ha who has stock uses his children to look after the stock. So the children don't go to school. The iron notion was in, in villagization that um, the farmers will have to look after the animals in herds because they're congregated together, they keep the animals in herds and so that they can husband the animals themselves so the children are released to go to the school. So the villagization offers, if it, if, it, if it was successful, it offers uh, different possibilities to a community. It offers a change, a sort of revolutionary change to the structure of the way people live their lives. And that would be the best. I mean, if it's done with force, and if it's done badly, and if, and if people can't see the advantages, then it may not work. But there is a, an, it is an opportunity for, for a structural change in the life of the peasant people. But in reality, it is not the same. I mean, a no. white villagization, people can come together, and then schools and health and everything can be open. Health, all the water, all the necessary... Roads. Yes, but all the necessary things can happen. happen. But in a given, it's not so there is a motive behind it. Just go back to you for well, a moment. Tell us, tell us what, go right back to the beginning. Tell us what you were saying about the way in which the concept of villagization, which Charles was describing, the way it's actually been implemented, in your view. Well, I don't think it has been implemented. To, to, to my way, of, I mean, I haven't been to Ethiopia since the villagization thing, but from the reports I've read and from people I have talked to, um, it's simply where they have collected the, the people from different villages into one place in order to control them. Um, but if I may go back and, 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 and talk about famine aid and... and, and no, come thing. on to that in a moment. Tell us how this collectivization, how the villagization is done. Explain what you were to explain to well, us a couple of moments ago, because we missed that. Basically, um, people tend to, in Ethiopia, tend to farm or build their houses near where the place that they're going to farm, sort of, so that they don't have to go very far to farm. Scattered dwellings, in effect. Yes, in fact. Um, now, what is happening is the place where they are farming is still there, but they are living some 10 kilometers or, or even further away. 
in the, the villages. In the villages. The government doesn't provide them with any transport. So they have to walk there every day, carrying their tools, and walk back every evening. Now, 10 kilometers is a hell of a long way. And that is not going to be um, sort of conducive to, to, or it's not an initiative for them to go and do that kind of thing. So basically, they've stopped farming. You also said there were, in your view, other motives the other for motives. the Ethiopian government pulling people together in villages. Yes, to control the people. Right. Uh, it's much easier to control the, um, a popul uh, population when they're all together. Why should they want to control the people? <laughs> Simply to power. The <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's a question of power. I mean, half of the population of Ethiopia are spies. I mean, it, it's a well-known oh, fact. Population. If not more, and for every Ethiopian and in, in Addis, in and Addis, in fact, right. in Addis, they, I'm not uh, defending any government or anything. All I'm saying is, I'm talking about present-day Ethiopia. For every one Ethiopian, there are three spies in Addis. I mean, some people find that very difficult to believe. Well, we you would, but I have lived under that system. I, I, I find it quite easy to believe. Look, well, t tell us what evidence there is to, to back that assertion. Look uh, at the amount of people in prison. Or dead. Or dead. Well, you know, you can't mm. refer only to uh, you know, <coughs> number of, uh, for example, you know, there is uh, a decree. If, you know, a person is found, just know is a leaflet from the opponent, the opponents. Then, you know, even if that person doesn't read what, you know, he has really in hand, because you know, he found it on his way he or she is going to be imprisoned for that, you know, because, you know, he already picked or she picked what has been, you know, on her way or on his way. It's really brutal. Even, you know, without just reading. And just, you know, even to mention something about the so-called bandits. Or, you know, to mention something about, you know, what's happening in towns. See something that, you know, really caused you, you know, a big problem. Charles. Is this, is this the Ethiopia you know? Well, there are bits of it that one recognizes, but um, I mean, I w people talk quite freely to me as a foreigner about the, their feelings about the government, and people who are critical about the government are critical to me. I mean, they may be the spies that are trying to get information <laughs> out of me. I, would, I, listen, I wouldn't know that. Uh, but but I've, I mean, I, I see a, a freer society, and I wouldn't argue that, it, that villagization doesn't give the possibility of greater control, but, but, but it's not something I've sort of seen. I can't see this. I mean, it does, in the place that we've been filming, it doesn't ring true to me because there isn't the, the control mechanism hasn't changed because the control is from the Woreda town and it hasn't shifted at all. And one of the things that I would be very critical about the Ethiopian government is its inability to get the extension workers out from the Woreda towns into the villages where they could do some good. They tend to sit in the towns and on the farmers, the peasants and the whole, they'll, they'll have to go into them. And if they were trying to control, then they're trying to control from the from these provincial uh, towns. And they, and they demand that the people come into them so that the control so I don't see that villagization has increased control at all. I see that villagization, I'm not sure if there's a, if there's a political r rationale for uh, villagization. It's very difficult for me to see, but it is much easier for me to see it as a, has it having a, a potential force for changing the society and bringing it perhaps into the 20th century before the 21st century arrives. Well, I, I must say, to me, to me, this part of the discussion has a tremendous feel, feeling of of I've been here before. Exactly a fortnight ago today, but exactly to the day I was in Hungary. My first visit there for many years. And I heard the chairman of the Communist Party saying, explaining why the collectivization has failed. The chairman of the Communist Party. There's no question that the basic aim was you may not have seen it, sorry, that took <laughs> easy I'm just talking of Hungary, and I know what happened in the Soviet Union, is that this was an attempt for the party to get, get control of the, of the rural population. That that is what this was all about. And it has failed in Hungary because it has led, as it did 
very uh, largely unsuccessful in the Soviet Union because the peasants did not like it. The combination of forced villagization and the underpayment of the farmers between them had undermined this situation in Hungary. And I was there exactly, to, not quite to the hour, but certainly to the day a fortnight ago. But villagization is not. I just have to correct one thing. Villagization is not collectivization. The two things are entirely different. Villagization leaves the farmers with their own land farming as they did before. So it's only actually moving their homes. It is not actually collectivization. And in that, that way, it is substantially different to collectivization. And shouldn't be... Surely the most important thing is that the so-called forced villagization, which did go on and was a mistake, has been acknowledged as being a mistake. The same as there's been reform of the agricultural pricing system. I think the difficulty that happened in Ethiopia, firstly, they don't have a large intellectual elite to go around and control anything. I mean, they, they have a relatively well, small did. intellectual, yeah. Yeah. They have a relatively they small did. intellectual, they they have a relatively the small dead. intellectual elite. Mm. Until 1974, they were basically a feudal economy. Although there were changes made by Haile Selassie, they never really took hold. I don't believe that when they first came into power, the Bureau <coughs> had any identifiable <coughs> ideology beyond a general wish to try and do well. And it wasn't until <coughs> Mengistu came to the top, some years after. Haile Selassie fell, that they decided they would try the command economy. Because after the famine, which they thought was caused by hoarding, they thought the best way of getting round this is by forcing everything into the centre. Now, with World Bank reports and other things behind them, they realise that that knocks a lot of the incentive out. But, you know, this idea that the Ethiopian government is somehow, with 20 million plus spies, pitted against the entire population, doesn't ring true. They are trying. They've got a lot of difficulties. They've got a lot of changes to make. But basically, and let me tell you, there's no one more likely to go hunting than the Conservative group in the European Parliament. That basically, the fact of the matter is that it's relatively uncorrupt in terms of the African countries that we have to deal with. It is a lot better. Yeah. And you will not find any aid agency that I've found who will say that they would rather be in, say, Nigeria trying to look after aid. Ethiopia is relatively easy to deal with compared to many of the other countries in the region. And I think we have to bear this in mind. It's, the dog has got a bad name because the dog has had a Soviet presence around and a Cuban presence around. And frankly, around this table tonight, we have three people from Ethiopia, an integral state, who are all basically from the other side. They are anti the government. And uh, I, I, I'm sorry that there's not a pro-government Ethiopian here. Richard, let, let, me say first, let me say first, let me say first, no, let me just yeah. first of all uh, make yeah. a point, which I think we ought to make at this, this point, that we did invite the, the yes. Ethiopian government oh, to, right. to send a representative along, and they, they were actually unable to, to provide somebody this evening. So, they were out of spot. Yeah. <laughs> whatever. Well, but, may, uh, may but, but, but please, Rebecca, something. you... you um, the thing that always fascinates me about um, Western people who go visiting Ethiopia is they assume they are actually see the actual situation in Ethiopia. Do you really believe that Mangusto is going to take you around and show you the prisons? But we have an office uh, there. The European community has an office there. And the we live there the and prisons? they send reports back every month to us. And uh, have you, uh, have and you ever seen the prisons? Have you been to the prison? You have been to the prison. Yeah, you have actually seen the prison. They have an office in well, Sudan. They have an office in the in Djibouti. They have an office. The people who know who supported them have an office also in Somalia. Who, who, who has an office in Somalia? Those you know who are saying that no, they have office in Ethiopia. Who? Who? Well, you the European Yes, and many other aid agencies. In the Sudan, yeah. in Djibouti, in Somalia. Yeah. So, there, what are we witnessing? We do witness hundreds of thousands of refugees. Why these people now yeah. are in Sudan? Why well, are they in Djibouti? Well, why, why are they, why are they, they in Sudan? This is the whole point. This is the, the, the question I would like to ask Richard Pauth. If it is such a marvelous uh, government, 
Why has Ethiopia got the, la the largest number of refugees in the whole of Africa? But it also is a host to the largest number of refugees from the rest of Africa as well. well yeah. I mean, there are, are they that's it. From, it's from Somalia. From, from Somalia. And, and from Sudan. Yeah. Why? From Sudan. Why? Why? It's, it's, it's you know. a, good, a good reason. Well, because the whole Horn of Africa is in the midst of turmoil, is the reason. Yes. Why? I mean, the reason. It just, it's good that, you know, you well, are it's not helped by It's not helped by the I civil war that's going on. That's part of the turmoil. Yeah, but that's why we must back the Carter peace proposals. And I want to ask our representatives from Tigray and from Eritrea whether they are genuine in supporting the Carter Peace Initiative or whether they regard it as purely being a propaganda exercise. Well, oh, um, oh, we could um, ask you, are the Ethiopians yes, serious? Yes, they are. Because they don't look very yes, serious. Yes, they are. Uh, anyhow, you know, the point is, you know, we are not really uh, touching the root cause of the problem. You know, we are just mentioning peace and that, you know. Why now we are asking for peace? Why also, the dirt at this particular time, when the people were demanding for peace long time ago, when also the other opponent groups, you know, were really trying to work, you know, under a peaceful solution. Uh, Rebecca, what's the answer Wait, to what those two th questions? Let, 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 let Rebecca answer. Well, well, actually, I don't think I should answer it. I think yeah, Richard should answer it. He seems to be the through. Ethiopian <laughs> government representative here. Um, <laughs> I've been as critical of them as many of you have. You know, when the, the, it's point, the point is, you know, the uh, the real issue you know. now you know the Derg is saying this you know they are for peace and they want to discuss you know with the Eritreans with the Tigrans and you know who else you know is eager to to, to sit and discuss with them why at this part of the what, what's the answer don't, yes. don't, don't ask me the question yes you know, I'm going to answer it there are you know re within Ethiopia there is a condition that has been created within Eritrea there is a condition that has been created by the people themselves because of you know, the evils of the dark, of the government, the policies which have been pursued for the last 15 years are now no more in a position to be really taken seriously by the people. People are saying enough is enough. Are those policies not changing now? Is no, the economy no, no, not no, liberalizing no, no. now? Yeah. Anyhow, before jumping that, let me, uh, let me finish what you know, I've started. Now, the people are really fed up of the war. They want to see the end of the war. Not only the people, but the army, the Derg, which you know was, was depending on the army for the last really 15, 16, uh, 40 years. Now they are saying that no, we don't want to fight against the Eritreans. We don't want to fight against the Tigrans or other Ethiopian brothers. We want to see the end of the war. And clearly, <coughs> it happened. Who, there, there, was the the, there was an attempt. There, yeah, I'm going. To, okay. Yeah. Yeah. There, there was an attempt, you know, to fight the government, even within the army. So now, you know, when the people, when the opponent forces are also, you know, making a headway and pressurizing the government, when the army is also not willing to do the fighting, the government doesn't have any outlet. It has to accept it. But, you know, accepting genuinely? No. It is not accepting genuinely. It doesn't want, it doesn't stand for peace. Always it has been a hindrance for peace. So you're, and you're basically is, saying that the that the Ethiopian government doesn't really want peace at this time. It does. It, what the government does in Eritrea. I mean, do, you, do, yeah. do the Eritreans? The thing is, I think let's bring it uh, this way. I mean, Eritrea. I'm, I'm going to talk about Eritrea now. I mean, Richard and Mark were putting Ethiopia as a sovereign is a sovereign country. Of course, it's a sovereign country within its own territory, not within Eritrea in the first place. Uh, I, I, I'm going back to the point where you have said that. Um, the OAU and the UN, or all that, uh, about the sovereignty of Ethiopia, and also, but putting Eritrea into, into Ethiopia. The Eritreans have been fighting for the last 28 years, just because of the colonial uh, uh, pressure. In the first place, you have to understand what the history of Ethiopia is, and also of Eritrea is. Eritrea has not been, never been part of Ethiopia in the first place. The, these two countries have been born t together during the 19th century, during the African scramble, when the colonizers came into, into being in Africa. So Eritrea is fighting merely for its independence because the Ethiopian government or the Haile Selassie regime at 1952 uh, or 62 have annexed it uh, forcibly. So that has to be recognized in the first place before you s we, we, we say that uh, Ethiopia is has a sovereign country, is a sovereign country, including Eritrea with it. So the problem of peace and the problem of war 
comes together. We were demanding peace in the first place from 1952 onwards, but the Ethiopian government saw its powerful in military even at that time because it was supported by the Americans and exit Eritrea by force. But we were still asking that Eritrea should not be part of Ethiopia. It so happened to have annexed it. After that, the military, I mean, the uh, armed, armed struggle have started. Since then, even, we were fighting for peace, not for war. We were also demanding, even in 1979, 1981, 1982, peaceful negotiations has to arise. This is not the first time that the EPLF is demanding, or the Ethiopian, or the Eritrean people are demanding for it. It was genuine since 1979. So you're saying the Eritreans are genuine in terms of the talks that are now taking place and they're genuinely seeking peace? That's right, yes. And what, do you, what about your, your view, Berhane, of the, the Ethiopian government's position in this? Do you believe they are, they are taking a cynical position or do you think that they too, for perhaps for geopolitical reasons, perhaps for economic reasons, do you think they too want peace? I don't think they are genuinely uh, wanting peace uh, because I would say from these two or three points that I will mention now, the Ethiopian government is now under pressure. One, because the whole population in Ethiopia is fed up of the situation in Ethiopia in the first place. Secondly, they are pressurized by the Tigrayans, by the Afas, by the Somalis, by the uh, Oromia, uh, and they can't help it but to sit down to gain momentum to gain time and during the Atlanta uh, negotiations even Mangustu were talking in Addis that the Eritreans are meddling we were not been meddling they are not coming into terms I think this is going to fail it was not failing and the uh, EPLF leader he was in America then he replied to say that it is going to be successful it's not going to fail. So that can show that it was a confusing uh, information to the world. Whatever's happening to the talks, what's actually happening in the war? Who's winning the war? I think the people are winning the war. If I'm going to talk in Eritrea, the Eritreans are winning. Since 1988, after Afabet, the strategic that was position... A, a major battle. A major ba battle in Afabet. Things are changing. The Ethiopian troops are mainly confined within the towns like Karen, Asmara, and perhaps the Kamare and Masao. Otherwise, the entire um, rural uh, area is in the hands of the EPLF, I would say. Rebecca, let me, let me come on to you for a moment. Um, Berhane was saying a few moments ago, was, was giving us a, a, a brief history lesson, if you like, uh, of, of, of the situation in colonial times and so on. You, of course, knew Ethiopia before the revolution that brought uh, uh, Mengistu to power. Uh, what was the country like at that stage? What were your memories of that period? Well, actually, knowing it is uh, it's a thing. I, I left my country when I was 11. Yes. Uh, and and uh, I was in this country. But um, my memory of, the, <coughs> of uh, Ethiopia is based in Eritrea. Uh, because my father was governor general there for eight years. So I know Eritrea much better than I know Ethiopia. Um, the thing that really uh, made me extremely bitter when I came out of prison is that nothing had changed. You said that when you came out of prison, tell us the story right from the beginning. What were you doing in prison? <laughs> um, well, I went back uh, to Ethiopia after I finished my studies here in June 1974. It's a very wrong time to go back. <laughs> How old were you then? I was just 21. And uh, a week later, they arrested my father, and in September, I was arrested together with my, the rest of my family. And I was kept nine years. The reason, uh, originally, that uh, when we asked why we were being arrested, uh, the, re the reason the government gave, uh, gave us was that we were in for our own security. 
that the people hated us so much that they were going to kill us or something. Um, but um, five years later, they released me, and uh, I knew the real reason why I was uh, um, arrested for all those five years. In the release paper that the government issues every prisoner, the reason for my arrest or detention was um, preventive detention. In other words, and the actual phrasing is uh, suspected of being a stumbling, stumbling block to the revolution, is the actual phrase they used. Um, after the nine years, I spent two months in Ethiopia before I left. And the thing that really, really saddened me about the whole thing is nothing had changed for the people. Governments come, governments go, but the people are basically the same. In fact, they were worse off than I remember them. Um, what were the conditions like during the period of the nine years you were in prison? The conditions in prison were basically terrible. Um, we were kept in one small room, the family and my family. Uh, there was originally 12 of us. Uh, there was just one toilet, if you can call it a toilet, just a hole in the ground. In fact, we were a, a lot more luckier than the rest of the prisoners, the women prisoners. Uh, there were, at one time, 400 women prisoners sharing one toilet. Um, the government didn't provide food or clothing or anything like that. So we basically depended on families and friends. Um, the male quarters was, was even worse. Uh, overcrowding and um, was really terrible. At one point they were just sleeping under sort of plastic tents because there was no room in the main prison for them. Um, and it was quite horrible in fact. What are your feelings now about that period of time, that, that wasted period of time in your life? <laughs> well, I don't know. Not really. I mean, I try not to be bitter, but uh, it's well, basically, I'm quite angry. Angry? Definitely angry. It's totally unnecessary. Not only for me. I mean, I'm, I'm not the exception. Um, there were millions like me, thousands like me. Uh, there were Eritreans who were arrested simply because they were Eritreans. Or at one point it was a crime to be young in Ethiopia, during the Red Terror, for example. I mean, anybody above the age of uh, 12, was automatically a threat to the government. W what was the Red Terror, as you described? The Red Terror is a government um, campaign, that, which went on for about two years. When, when was when, it? Uh, during 77, between 77 and 79, uh, when the government went berserk, literally berserk. What happened? Uh, they declared that, um, in fact, I, I remember one particular speech uh, made by Mangistu saying, why fill the prisons? Just kill them. And it was Addis Ababa and all the towns in Ethiopia were covered in blood. And this is uh, the story that people like Richard Bach would never tell or, or would not, not be shown. Uh, early morning, the, the apparently the... Uh, fire brigade's job was to clean the street so that the blood, uh, the, 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 there was no sign of the blood. Um, in fact, the ironical thing is that during those years, the safest pa place in Ethiopia probably was the prison. It and that's where you were? That's where we were. And, uh, and in fact, I remember uh, 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 some uh, students who came and we thought they were completely mad because the minute they <coughs> entered the, the gate, they kissed the ground because they were so grateful for, for surviving, you know, the, the terror outside. It was that bad. What happened to your family? Uh, well, I was released together with my brothers and sister. Well, my, they shot my father in 74, uh, uh, but I was released together with my brothers and sister in 1983. They kept my mother and um, my aunts and my cousins for another, until last year, in fact, 1988. And they just released the last three of my cousins in, in the last amnesty in September. Now, you paint a, a picture of, of the post-revolutionary government of Ethiopia, which is, which is bloody, um, uh, abuse of human rights, uh, 
abuse of, of the people in the widest sense of the word. That's mm. the picture that you paint. What was Ethiopia like prior to that revolution under, in the feudal times, under Haile Selassie? I don't think it was that great either for the people uh, of Ethiopia generally. But there wasn't that terror. Maybe, you know, maybe because I haven't lived or because of the I haven't been to Ethiopia, but I, I definitely don't think there was that terror. Uh, the but, fact uh, I think you have experienced it in Eritrea. Uh, well, uh, other uh, parts of Ethiopia too. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Slightly well, chaos uh, uh, for the last four years of Haile Selassie, frankly. Probably. And uh, 74. Well, starting from 1964, I'd say, in Eritrea, uh, many uh, women, even pregnant, have been uh, killed by knife. That is, I think. Under the Haile Selassie regime. Under the Haile Selassie oh, yeah. regime. Uh, uh, actually, the reason why you know, the uh, uh, present regime came to power was you know, because the whole people in Ethiopia were against the feudal system of the Haile Selassie regime. Uh, the people were suppressed in every aspect. The people were really fed up of the uh, disadvantages from the economical and political situation. And also, you know, the rights, democratic uh, rights also the people, of the people were denied. Then, you know, they reached at a stage where they cannot uh, really tolerate what they were really accepting as something that was really given by them, uh, to them by God. Then they started to say no for everything, for the economic, political, and social uh, orders from the high class region. Then, you know, they started to apply against the Heslasi government. It is at that time, this government, you know, at that time, just, you know, a small committee, which stepped in and grabbed the power, which was, you know, to be, supposed to be, you know, in the hands of the, the people. Otherwise, you no, know, we cannot say that, you know, during Heslasi, the time was good enough for the people. It was as bad as this present time. As bad as? Yes. Mm -hmm in different forms. Now, what do we witness? The present government came and stayed, you know, in power as a provisional government, imagine, as a provisional government for 13 years or 14 years, as a provisional government. It <coughs> promised to the people that it's going to only stay not in power, only for a year, until now it do away with all the feudal remnants. But, you know, even so, the people were not really happy with what now was going on. They were resisting. That was why, you know, the people of Tigray started the uprising or the struggle in 1975. That was why, you know, the people of Oromo didn't accept the rule of this government from the very beginning. That was why also the people in Afar, in other parts of Ethiopia, were not even you know, ready to accept this. Then, you know, this government since it was not having the sympathy or the support from the people, it started to show its muscle that you know, it is ready to crush any uprising, any person in an individual, be it you know, in or, an organized manner or on an individual basis, to crush in order to maintain its superiority on the people. So from the moment that you know, it came to power, it issued decrees that you no know, people shouldn't go in group of five. People shouldn't utter a word about an increment in salary or an improvement in their daily life because they were told that no, this is a revolution that is being voiced and everybody has to really be committed not to the revolution, has to serve the country, <coughs> to defend the motherland. Then you know, the rights of the people were denied. The people were not, you know, they were, you know, they are not in a position to say, yes, this is our government. Mm. Yes, this is our, our government where we can express our views. They know that you know, they would be crushed, they would be imprisoned, they would be killed. Richard, in, in a sense, I mean, it seems to me you're, you're, you're being um, painted here as an apologist for the, the regime. Is that, is that fair? I think it's quite unfair. I mean, Bahani will remember for a start, together with Bernard Brain and Margaret Davis, Africa as being pawns to shuffle around and rake in the votes at the UN, or whether we genuinely regard them as equal partners in a civilized world. Can I ask a, a specific question, if, if I may, of, of, of Mark Bowden? 
the, the, the picture that Rebecca uh, and others have, have painted of Ethiopia is, is obviously a, a, a very troubling one. Now, as Richard says, you know, uh, these things are in, in some senses relative. But if, what, if the, 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 the worst side that is being painted is in any sense real, true, genuine, how on earth can your organization do business with these people? Well, I think we don't do business. I mean, that's the, the, the distinction. I mean, I, I don't actually challenge a lot of what's been said about Ethiopia. I've probably been to Ethiopia more recently than most people here. Uh, and, I mean, just to go over some other issues, I mean, yes, I mean, there are grave human rights issues in Ethiopia. We as an agency were particularly disturbed about the nature of resettlement uh, and also not happy about the nature of villagization, though I would say it was patchy. I mean, I think that, 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 I mean, what we're getting is a very black and white view of Ethiopia, which I think is, is certainly not one that we can, it's not practical to work with uh, uh, as an agency. Practicality comes into it. Well, it? I think practicality comes into it because there are 40 million people in Ethiopia. And, the, and, and as everybody says, they probably don't support the government, just like 50% of the people in Britain don't support the government here. I mean, you know, that's, in, that's in the nature of government. You know, I mean, that's, uh, uh, SCF does not work with governments in that sense. I mean, what I think we're trying to do, I yes, would yeah. say, say the children's yes, fund, yes, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that the real problem for us, I mean, and I, I would say that our involvement in Ethiopia has been troubled. It's not an easy relationship, uh, and it's one that I think we would question time and again. As we would question our relationship, we work in South Africa, as it happens, and I would defend our right to work in South Africa, and we certainly don't legitimise the South African government. And you say it's a troubled relationship. How specifically well, it's, is it? it's troubled? troubled because I think that the issues I would bring up in Ethiopia is not that it's a corrupt government. I don't think that, that it is corrupt in the straightforward sense of people lining their pockets with aid. Uh, I mean, it may happen. I mean, when you put large amounts of aid in any country, it goes into people's pockets at times. I mean, um, I don't think the percentages in Ethiopia are high. That's not the issue. The issue is to do with the direction of aid and the control of that direction of aid, which is far more a concern. No, okay, explain what you mean by that. Well, for example, you might find that specific areas, as I think Abadi would, would, would claim, is that, that aid has been directed or has not been directed to major areas of need because the governments have other priorities. For example, one could make a case, I'm not making it, but one could make the case that, that in, in the period of resettlement, that a food aid, official flows of food aid, were diverted towards resettlement, which was a costly and I think misjudged exercise and, and, and badly handled. Uh, we were critical of the pro and, and that actually stopped aid going to areas of Highland Ethiopia that, that, that perhaps should have been looked at and people should have been given the chance to find their own solutions to, to coping with the drought rather than, than have what was at best a theoretical, I mean a highly theoretical response uh, to, the, to the famine. I mean, albeit devised by the American government or whatever, it was a theoretical response which didn't understand the needs of the farmer. The point for us, really, was that we still felt there was some point in carrying on because, A, we could, uh, to some extent, redirect resources, but also, more importantly, we felt it, there was uh, the need to take up the issues internally within the country, and that's one thing an outside group can do. I'm Did you do that? Yes. We did. Did. Successfully do it? Well, life was made very difficult for us, I don't know whether it's successful or not. I mean, I, I, I would actually argue that resettlement was scaled down considerably from the original plans because it became unacceptable to the Western world. I mean, we lobbied the Western donors, we lobbied the EEC, we lobbied the UN, you know, and, and, and you know, we pushed very hard about it. So I, I think people began to realise that not only was it impractical, but it would lose them a lot of financial support and assistance. So as long as we have a voice of some sort, now, you know, it's a difficult argument to, to sustain. I, you know, that's why I think we have to keep on questioning it. As long as we have some sort of voice. Uh, I mean, what I'm really unhappy about, actually, is, is the fact that we are outsiders saying this thing. You know, uh, and, and as I said, it's whether you feel there is a legitimate role for the outsider to go and say, look, these issues are unacceptable. Yes, I, I really want to say something about outsiders because a lot of this is outsiders talking. And there's various assertions being made today, tonight, about Ethiopia, which apply to Africa in general. References to the OAU policy, for example, that boundaries shouldn't be changed. And we have to remember that the whole of Africa, or virtually the whole of Africa, is in fact a hangover from previous colonial regimes. We talked about South Sudan and North Sudan, those were both colonies 
albeit with the same colonial master, but separate. And I find it quite extraordinary that people should sit outside and say that at all costs we've got to preserve something which the people don't want. We talk about balkanization, that people can't have these countries breaking up. And I find this really extraordinary from Europeans, where we've been at war with each other for many hundreds of years, fought two major wars in the last century, in fact, in the last 90 years. And to say then that these things mustn't happen in Africa, that the Africans somehow have less right to govern themselves in the way that they want than other people, and therefore we're going to maintain it. And I think the problem with the whole aid program for Ethiopia, and it isn't only Ethiopia, there are other examples of it, is that it is one part, and a very major part, of sustaining unpopular governments. And when I mean unpopular, I mean they don't have the support of the population that they control in power. The other part is the military. The special thing about Ethiopia, I think, is in spite of what you've said about the Soviet Union, there is no evidence that, apart from a few comments made to the Washington Post, that the Soviet Union is pulling out of Ethiopia. They are still arming them. So there is only one side to that particular argument. But I don't think that we as Europeans have a right to say to the Eritreans or to anyone else, I'm sorry, you know, we left you like this at colonialism. And don't forget that Eritrea was run by the British after the Second World War. Uh, you've got to stay put because foreign powers have decided that you must, and I think this is the problem. There's a gross uh, interference. Well, whether, whether Westerners say well, we to are. the... To, yes, but mm. whether Westerners mm. do say to the Eritreans or the Tigrans or whoever, mm. you know, you know, it, it, the borders have got to stay the same, and I'm sorry, mm. the simple reality is that the, the, whatever Westerners say, the Eritreans and the Tigrans aren't listening, are they? Yes. I mean, they wish to, to have their own autonomy, and so therefore a war is de facto in existence. Yes, but when whatever we're saying, the war in Eritrea has gone on for 28 years and probably wouldn't have done without gross interference from outside, from both the Soviet Union and the Americans. Why? Because the because Ethiopian regime would... Because people resolved it between themselves. And, uh, you know, we don't give any room for that by interfering um, in the aid side, giving money to... And goods to governments who are sustaining themselves in power. And I think also what we'll be missing in this discussion, Rebecca touched on it, but we didn't come into this, um, when we're talking about villagization and resettlement and so forth, is that one of the things that the aid has done, and of course the major aid is from the EEC and governments, I accept that, is that we've enabled the Ethiopian government to so far managed to feed people, albeit very poorly, in the cities, and particularly in Addis Ababa, so there has been no uprising against them in Addis Ababa. Having said that, I appreciate what <laughs> Rebecca said, that memories of what happened in 60, in 77 and 78 are still very strong, and people don't want to be shot down in the streets. So you're saying that people don't have a right to food in the cities? No, what I'm saying is that what have we been supporting, because most of the food in fact goes to the cities, if food is delivered to Eritrea tomorrow, it will go to Asmara and Masawa because those are the only two places where the Ethiopians can deliver food. You, you know what uh, actually Mark was mentioning was mm. the situation in mm. 1985. And I was really uh, astonished by the response of the uh, British people and the people in different mm. European and uh, the United States. Uh, they are really you know, trying to do their best. They are trying to control something from they are really uh, earning to the uh, elevation of the plight of the people of Eritrea and Ethiopia. Then, on the other side, what were we looking at? There were agencies, big agencies involved. There were governments involved, you know, showing that now they are really there to support the people who were affected by the famine. Then, now, let's take Tigray. The 1984-85, Tigray was, in fact, the most drought affected area. At that time, it was the Tigray People's Liberation Front, which was administering the countryside, 85% of the countryside. Over 90% of the people of Tigray live in this countryside. Then, at that time, what were the organizations, Relief Society of Tigray, which is working in this area, and the TPLF, Tigray People's Liberation Front, 
was, you know, we were asking. They were saying, look, the, most of the people are living in the countryside. And there is a possibility that food could be <coughs> given to these people while they are in their villages. If, you know, there is an understanding that you know, the government, the Ethiopian government could allow food to come to the uh, villages so that agencies could take the food to the villages and really ensure the provision of food or relief item while the people are in their village. Then, you know, at that time, the government said no. Then what did the agents reply? Most of the, agen the agencies, they were really, you know, portraying the image of the dirt. As you know, was intending to do something, but due to lack of infrastructure, there was no possibility of supporting the people in the countryside. Well, what about the so, difference you know, between the agencies and, yeah. for example, the response that occurred at that time, namely of something like, say, Live Aid and Band Aid? I mean, would that a, was that a more effective or more valuable response? Yeah, I'm coming to that point. Okay, that's a good uh, question. So what's the answer to that? Yeah, then, you know, the, the point is, you know, the agencies at that time, when the policy of the Ethiopian government was really something that was working against the people of Tigray, I guess the, the agencies wish. were working yes. against the people. Yeah. Ma yes. Ma yes. Ma no, no, no. Was your agency working uh, against the people? Uh, you know, you know, no, this is a point that has to be made. Both the, uh, the TPLF actually took our team hostage at one stage no, and disrupted the relief this is, operations. No, this is, this is uh, and the, and the, you know that all agencies have some problems. I mean, ERA uh, or not ERA, the Eritreans attacked a relief convoy from Eritrea. I mean, nobody's got quite clean hands in the whole operation. Uh, you know, I mean that that's. You know, as I said, if we get into black and whites, no, I mean, there's been a considerable NGO support for Tigray. NGO, again. Uh, Non-governmental organizations. Charities. The agents a lot of well. charities have supported Tigray. They have had some uh, <laughs> bilateral assistance. They have had some EEC assistance. Got a lot of EEC uh, You know, that it, it, there are problems. Uh, obviously, in, as I said, both in the practicalities and the sensitivities involved. I mean, I'm not un underlying that. I mean, I think that we as an agency, we're more cautious in supporting work in Tigray. Uh, but then there are other agencies who felt they could support work in Tigray, not in Ethiopia. Mm. So you can't say that all the agencies uh, have had, a, you know, that there are I mean, pragmatic decisions that get made about your area of activity and the area that you can provide assistance to the people. And I think that, that you know, if we get channeled into goodies and baddies, it's a very sterile discussion about the nature of, 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 of relief assistance, because it isn't about in the end, about goodies and baddies and who's right or wrong. Uh, I mean, I, you know, not talking about legitimacy. It's really about how in a famine, which is where we started out, how in a famine, which is complicated by the war, I mean, made worse by the war, but how in a famine you provide assistance and help to people who are starving, despite all those complications. Mm. And I think you've got to use a variety mm. of routes. And, and is, it, is that not a fair point, Berhan? I mean, would you, in a uh, sense, uh, aid has become, has it not, a weapon of war that is used by all sides. No, I wouldn't say that, uh, because I don't believe that um, through our side, through the Eritrean side, how put it so. But you attacked a food convoy. Uh, I will, I will also replay that. Uh, this is my second time I have to be questioned about it in our channel four, and I will put it this way: uh, as I said, the war was going for the last 28 years. And it so happened that the Ethiopian government, or the Dutch uh, troops, always use an excuse of passing a, a disputed area. If they cannot be able to cross any road by their military personnel or vehicles, they do use the uh, 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 tracks which are carrying food. The UN tracks. UN tracks, whatever. Whatever. Yes. So you so were saying that that has that against the UN. Yeah. The United. You're saying United Nations in its any own transport uh, what is I'm carrying saying, Ethiopian troops. What, what I'm saying is any trucks, any trucks which UN. are. You said UN. You said UN. You no, you did. But but do you are you agreeing? Do you agree that are you, is your allegation that UN trucks uh, uh, actually carry Ethiopian troops? Is that were they the UN trucks then? I mean, they were not the UN tracks in the first place. Yes. Have been attacked at that time. Tell me if they are. I think they were. They, they, they were. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Exactly about it. If, even if they were UN tracks, you know what the position was in Eritrea and Tigray. 
there is a conflict going on. There is fight. This is a war zone. And you know these trucks, they are passing through an area where the Ethiopian government was not in control. Then you know these agents, be it United Nations, SF or anyone else, they were told that you no. Know, whenever you know they move their relief items through these areas, it's good that you now they inform the people who are responsible, you know, or who are who are in control of this area. You then you know what the, what, what, what the problem was, you know. When they move the food to a government area, they only you know, try to, to work with the government. In reality, when the government was not in that position. But if but they don't know, inform the, the point is, does no. that mean that it's no, no, fair the, game to attack those no. truck convoys? The, the point is no. Then, you know, using this as an excuse, the derg which was not in a position to move from one place to another place, got the chance to carry on its food and other supplies to the next garrison, you know, taking the chance of the UN or the SF or any other agencies uh, uh, convey, you know, to, to, to support the next, the next military force, the military so, garrison. So, so, you know, this in is a sense, uh, so my looking. question then is a simple one. If, uh, are you saying to me that if, if the Ethiopian government uses food convoys as a way of moving its troops or of a, as a way of supplying its garrisons, then it becomes fair and proper and perfectly acceptable for you to attack those food convoys. Yes, the point, the point is, you know, if this convoy is going to be used against the people who are there, because, you know, by supporting a garrison, it means, you know, keeping that military post to be strong enough so that it could go out of the garrison and wipe out the district or the, the village, cause a lot of destruction, cause a lot of displacement of the people, because you know, we know, always know the army <coughs> does the destruction, always the army of the Ethiopian government, cause a lot of raping and all, you know, uh, evil things. The then, you know, the, the people there, you know, way. they are defending, they are defending, you know, that, you know, they don't have to be uh, distracted, they ha don't have to be the targets yeah, of no, this no. military post. Then, you know, the point is, you know, if these are used as an excuse, yeah. and if, you know, the people are not supported or benefiting from their, this relief item. What for are these convoys going on? What so for you, you, you this is for the, going to that uh, post? Well, it was a UN convoy that was attacked, and they were flying UN flags, and um, the position of the UN trucking fleet, which was funded largely by Band-Aid, um, was very difficult. I mean, they, for instance, they couldn't, in a country that's very short of trucks, it meant that the UN trucks in those disputed areas were traveling in convoys, and that reduces the efficiency very dramatically because they, w they have to build up a group of trucks which are coming sp spasmodically to a p particular point, and they build them up oh. until they have 50 or 60 trucks, and then they why, drive why, them through. Because they have, they're because they are less likely to be attacked, no, presumably. That, in fact, well, this is a real problem. Then, 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 right. The forces were saying that no food could be food. You know, the convoys are allowed to move to areas where the people are in need of. And you know, if this convoy carrying food, relief items, are going to pass, they don't have to be escorted by military personnel. But you know, if there are military personnel, well, the, the you know, this was informed. But the but the U but the UN fleet would not move with a military escort. They were. They, were. they would that's not. That's well, that's well, that is the point. Well, a because you know, the military, the Ethiopian government was using it as an excuse. The it UN was really escorting the. Uh, the, the UN insisted person. that they were not in, not escorted but by. But that was not uh, the reality. Mm. So Maybe you're saying the UN are liars. Well, that your case is the UN, the UN insists alive. that they're the, the trucks yeah, never yeah, sorted no, by army. Uh, yeah, 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 was, was, uh, you, you don't have any friends at all, do you? The not yeah, even the UN? The, the yeah, what is the UN? The UN is, you know, the... Uh, I don't uh, believe a, a the country. United Nations will lie. Well, yeah, this could have been no, done. No, I mean, after, after, after all, I'd like to ask our lady here a question. What is your view of Eritrea now? Your father was Governor General of Eritrea on behalf of Ethiopia. Do you I, believe it should be I, part of Ethiopia? Well, personally, I think it will have to be settled. One, the, the only way it can be settled is around the table. Mm. Uh, I do not believe in the fighting. I don't think any, any one side is going to win it. 
But I think um, what we have to learn is the art of compromise. Both you sides. and I agree. Yes, I, I, I believe that, I mean, the Eritrean question is just one of the mm. problems, or the ethnic or mm. the nationality problems that Ethiopia is yeah. facing. I think, I don't know, I mean, I'll have to ask Brahana that, but um, I don't know to what extent the Eritreans are willing to compromise. Because, let me tell you, uh, one thing, uh, um, there is an accusation among the Ethiopian, the rest of Ethiopia, is the one factor that has kept Mengistu in power for 15 years is the fight, the war. The war. It is one thing that the fact that he has existed for 15 years is because people are not willing to let go of Eritrea. They don't want um, to. Let me, let me finish. It, it, it is one view. Um, and I don't think any government will survive, any Ethiopian government will survive without Eritrea. Do you think that Derg is going to uh, continue okay, his yes. uh, role I don't for another uh, 15 or no, 20 years? No, I don't. Yes. I do not believe that. Uh, can uh, tell me um, before we go on to that? Yes. I would also like correct this say, very I misleading say, impression that's been I given about say. food, <laughs> yes. the food convoys, because I think this is very important. And a great deal was made of this by the Ethiopian government about the food, co a food convoy being attacked. Now, first I have to say that I have seen, in fact, a film, uh, I've not forgotten which channel it's on, I think Yorkshire Television, of the places where convoys were attacked. And I have to tell you that many of these were actually in the Eritrean-controlled area, so they must have been attacking their own food convoys. Oh, and these were little spots all over the map by a certain journalist who had been named. But you've got to look at it also in its totality of this business of the UN and all these other agencies going money. Where does it end up? Now, I had, on two occasions, 83 and 84, was in Eritrea when very large garrisons were taken by the Eritreans, one in Tessanai and one in, on the coast at Mersa Tekla. At Mersa Tekla, I saw relief aid piled as high as you could possibly see including fortified milk for children which was <coughs> and all sorts of sacks and jars and everything with love from the people of, Ethi of Sweden and the Red Cross in Italy and everything piled high in the Ethiopian garrison. And there's no doubt at all <coughs> that during a state of famine that a hundred thousand troops were not fed off the products of the land when Ethiopia was claiming famine. So that is another side of it. In Tessanai, there were even UN, uh, not UNDP or UN Relief, <coughs> but there were UNICEF lorries in the garrison at Tessanai, and also various things donated for children there. I saw them with my own eyes the day after these places fell, piled as high as you could make, see them. So I think it's a futile thing to get bogged down on whether it's EPLF or EPLF knocked off a lorry. The scale of the misuse of aid is much greater than that. And this is the problem about giving aid to governments. In the long run, you can't really control it. And there was no way that any organization, unless they dished this food out themselves, spoon by spoon to the population, could ensure that the people in need got it. Where did that aid actually come from? All over the place. I've seen it from almost every country in Europe, from many voluntary organizations, from Canada from the United States, you name it, I've seen it. Was, it. was it national government aid or was it charitable aid, oh, yeah, aid no, like lot, from, from Band Aid and so on? There was lots of from Red Cross and various German organizations that I saw in Mercer Teclai who were voluntary organizations. I didn't see Band Aid in there because it wasn't going at the time, mm. but no doubt some of it ended up. I mean, you can't maintain an army of 100,000 people and not feed them. It's really ridiculous. Tell me this in general terms. I'm not asking mm. here specifically mm. about Ethiopia, though I'd be interested mm. to know whether you think Ethiopia is, is better or worse than other, mm. uh, other countries uh, around the world that receive aid. When uh, somebody has their heartstrings tugged by a particular mm. event somewhere and they dip into their pocket and they give £10 to uh, an aid charity, what proportion of that £10, generally speaking, in your view, Mary, finds its way into the mouths of starving children or whatever? Well, then, of course, as you say, that does depend on the country. Um, I think, as far as Save the Children Fund are concerned, I believe they distributed their own aid, so we're not talking about something like that. 
that there are many other organisations that gave money to the Relief and Rehabilitation Committee or gave goods to them, and those ended up in the wrong place. I've met many people who worked in that organisation who know that the thing was a fraud from start to finish. In, in Even which, in which the Relief and Rehabilitation Commission that Charles in, was talking about. In Ethiopia. Yes. And we know that, in fact, the director of that defected to the United States and has spilled the beans in a book and revealed all about the fraud that went on. Everybody knows that it does. What, what sort of proportion are we talking about? I think it's very high. Very high indeed. 30%? Because of the... 50%? Probably, yes. I'm not talking about where organisations do their own thing on the ground, but there aren't many of those. The EEC, for example was given so, large quantities of aid which arrived in Assab and God knows where and finished up. So did Bob Geldof, in effect, waste his time? No, and, and I think that, that I mean, if you, if you look at the total tonnages, I mean, something like a million, a million and a quarter tons went into Ethiopia in 84, 85, uh, of which, uh, as Charles said earlier, the Americans were the largest donor. Uh, they made sure that their food aid was entirely distributed. I mean, it caused some rancor with the Ethiopian yeah. government, but their food aid was entirely distributed by uh, Care, World Vision, uh, and CRS. I mean, that's CRS, uh, yeah. Catholic yeah. Relief yeah. Services. Sorry, I mean these are all awful acronyms. Uh, so, I mean, and the Catholic Secretariat uh, took a large amount of the European aid as well. I mean, by and large, I think that this whole issue about government aid. I mean, the, the bilateral donors and the major bilateral donors voted with their feet and said that we will only give food aid through uh, voluntary agencies who are distributing and accounting for the food aid in Ethiopia. Now, I mean, undoubtedly something like 400,000 tonnes went through RRC stocks and, and what pressures there were on that. I, RRC, so the Relief sorry. Commission against right, right, Relief right. Commission. We're all caught up in our acronyms in Ethiopia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I think that the donors... Uh, bilateral donors, NGOs, are a great, as I said, I mean, in the end, I think that the, the great crime of Ethiopia was not that food aid went astray, but that a famine was ignored for a long time when it could have been prevented far earlier because it was politically difficult for everybody. I mean, the great crime of Ethiopia is that they were a Marxist government, so the Western donors wouldn't give them assistance. They didn't care about the people, they cared about the government. They didn't care about TPLF. I mean, it goes for everybody. You know, I mean, nobody's except. But it's too difficult to help TPLF in a big way. You know, none of the UN have not found a way. I mean, they have failed in Ethiopia, I think. You know, the UN have actually failed in finding free access into contested areas. I mean, the rules as they are written at the moment do not allow agencies to distribute food aid or assistance freely. You know, I mean, the, the, the crime that we're talking about is actually trying to help people. And we've got embroiled in the rights and wrongs of the argument. You know, we actually avoided and ignored a famine, of which we're responsible, and that's what, you know, Band-Aid or whatever did. It said, look, politics are not part of the issue in this case, where, where, when a whole nation, wherever they are, are starving. Uh, and, and I think that, that better prevention, which involves, in fact, the building up of infrastructure for all parties, yeah. which... Is that, no, is that no, a job? No, 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 we keep the talking the about infrastructure. Unless you give me the word, I'm going to leave. Well, you can do so, but I mean, uh, your, your moment will come, but it's entirely up to you to, to sort of join in the conversation. As, as but as the, the point in Nokia has made you, has to be known. Do so. There are certain points that have to be clarified. There is no guarantee, you know, by giving to agencies that you know, the food is going through the people. Easier, the less are the stakes in the fight for power. And therefore, I think the whole idea of compromising or to be linked somehow to the idea of depoliticization. Mm. It should not be a matter of life and death for large numbers of people who has the government. That will make compromises much easier. I, I do not know Eritrea, uh, um, Ethiopia at all well, as I confessed before now, but I know a large part of the so-called third developed, uh, so-called uh, third world pretty but well. Peter, tell me, how would depoliticization as you call it. How would that work? How would it happen? How would it be brought about? Well, for, no, I think I would turn this upside down. The, how did the politicization come about? Because, um, because it's only in the last 30 years or so that it has become in so many parts of what is now called the third world, matter of life and death, 
economic life and then of the physical life and then who has the government for example uh, I, I, I can think of Malaysia which I know well reasonably well and Sri Lanka which I know fairly well different communities live peaceably together until it became a matter of life and death who has the government and this has come about by the acceptance of, of the idea that material progress and economic welfare and everything depends on what the government does and we must give them all the power to do so. That's how that politicization has come about and official aid, not the only factor behind this, has contributed to this. And uh, can, I, can I just ask Berhane whether the, the thesis that you raise there, whether that has any resonance for him? Do you, do you do you think that what Peter's saying I, I, is, I, is true? I, uh, not entirely, but uh, some of his points I agree, because we don't want to be patronized in the first place. And we, don't want, uh, we also want the compromise, what Rebecca had mentioned, but compromise and what? The compromise is uh, the people themselves have to decide. It's not me and you, Rebecca, hmm. to decide uh, to what the people want. It is, it, that is, in fact, been raised by the EPLF so many times. Uh, that what, what compromise is the EPLF prepared to make in the in the, the initiative that Jimmy Carter is involved with? The the it, it, the every time people has to be consulted to whether they want to be independent or it is after all the people who decides if they want to be independent, if they want to be part of Ethiopia, or if they want to be. Um, uh, federal government with Ethiopia, whatever. I mean, it is the people who decide. <coughs> it's not even the EPLF as such who decides, but the fate of the Eritreans. All right, it, it represents the Ethiopian, the Eritrean people, but it is, at the end of the day, the people are going to decide. So this has been also been offered to the Ethiopian government long, long time ago, not now. Ten years ago, seven years ago, there was a referendum which has been clearly stated there to say that okay let's sit down and talk with these points the points are simply leave these things to the people I, I do what I'd like to do if I may I'd like to move on to a, another area an area that we've we've touched upon briefly the the area of, of, of geopolitics I mean we've talked as it were uh, 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 peripherally about some of the uh, some of the the other large countries that have an effect within the area of the Horn of Africa. Um, now, earlier on, Johanna, you uh, told us something of, the, of the, the history of Ethiopia up to the time of uh, the Derg and the, and, and the rise to power of Mengistu and so on. What I'd like to do, just to sort of inform the next part of our debate, is to ask Richard Balfe just to tell us, because I know this is an area where, where you've done quite a lot of work, Richard, just tell us a little bit about some of the, the geopolitics of the area and how it has shifted over the years and how, for example, the Soviet Union and the United States have shifted sides and what effect that has had in the area. Well, of course, it's only my interpretation of it, but of course, uh, yeah. basically, if you bring your little map up, um, which uh, is always a, a guide... Would you like... Would you yeah, like that, no, one? that one? That one, that one. Yeah. 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 We'll come to the other one in a moment. What you, what, what you basically had is that the Soviet Union began by backing Somalia and then is now backing Ethiopia. The Eritrean can speak for themselves as to who backed them originally. I can only say that my first contact with the cause of Eritrea was brought to my notice by people from the... Uh, Soviet bloc rather than from the American bloc many years ago. In the Sudan you basically, and I think Peter would agree, got a split between the north and the south. <coughs> the Arab north, the southern south, it did used to be the north Sudan and the south Sudan and we administered it. And in Ethiopia, my reading of it is that you also got a similar split between an uh, Amharic Christian tradition based on Addis and the more Arabist tradition based as you get further north. And uh, what, what I think one... I think... Uh, what I think I, I we... Think I, I let, let me... Yeah, what, 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 what I think is can not... Can I just interrupt him? This is the second time that he is uh, well, saying that uh, well, Arabic uh, traditions, all that. 
He's I mean, a, he, he, well, a Muslim he, tradition. Well, I think it, that's wrong to, 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 to come into life. Uh, after all, um, uh, in Eritrea also there are Muslims and uh, uh, Christians, the same church, in fact, with the Ethiopian uh, uh, population. Hold on a second. I mean, I think that's, that's not fair to say that this is what they are, uh, which they are not. Because it is predominantly uh, Muslim. No, no, half and half. Not according to the UN. Well, when well uh, we, 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 we take the census. When did the UN take their <coughs> census? <coughs> Where were they travelling when they did it? Come on. <laughs> Show us. There's the uh, anything, map, anything could be written, which is in the country study of Ethiopia, and it quite clearly shows that there's a, a strong Muslim majority in the north. But I mean, where this did is, they get their this, from? this is one thing which actually has never been challenged before. But if you wish, if you wish to accept that maybe there isn't a distinct tradition in Eritrea, I was trying to make a point that there was a separate culture and a separate tradition. If you wish to deny there's a separate culture and tradition. <laughs> that actually strengthens the hand of the Addis government. But the, the main geopolitical point, I think, that is now affecting the Horn of Africa is the reassessment of the Soviet Union as to the, its role in world geopolitics, and we have seen significant changes. I believe that the Soviet Union now genuinely wishes to withdraw from the military involvement. This is why it's put pressure on to get the Cuban troops home from the Southern African theatre, this is why it's put pressure on to get the Vietnamese troops out of the Cambodian theatre. And this is why I believe if the Jimmy Carter Peace Initiative is given a fair wind by all concerned, that there is a fair chance that the Cuban presence and the Soviet military assistance in Ethiopia will be scaled down. Then the point Rebecca made becomes much more true. Because whether or not the Ethiopian government survives, the one thing I think which is absolutely evident is that the war has been a great unifying factor. And it's been a great factor within Ethiopia, within the Amharic part of Ethiopia, in helping to pull the people together at a difficult time. And that, that is my reading of it, based on a number of visits there. I dare say, as I said at the beginning, it, it is my interpretation, I dare say that it's open to challenge by others, but I feel at the moment the best thing we can do is to try and promote peace in both Ethiopia and in the Sudan, because next door, in the very next door, you've got a civil war going on with the headquarters of the southern Sudanese, John Durang's headquarters, is actually inside on Ethiopian territory. So each side is giving sustenance to the civil war in each other's country, and this is where you need the, the intervention of the greater powers. And one final point. This myth that the people decide really is a myth. The solution has to come between the elected political leaders of the people in trying to find some solution that they can all live with together. You can't have a solution based on a completely open book. That won't happen. But what I believe you can have is, a, I believe you can have a solution which preserves the territorial integrity of both Ethiopia and the Sudan with a very, very high measure of devolvement in both countries, recognising the very separate cultural history and aspirations of important peoples within those countries. I, I, I think if you could put, bring the map up again, let's look at the real problems. I mean, it isn't really a problem between the Arab, Arabs in Eritrea and the Christians <laughs> in Addis. This is a gross oversimplification. Um, let's go back, in fact, to the scramble for Africa when the, many of these territories were set, including Ethiopia. Much of the south was conquered by Menelik, and Rebecca will confirm this, at the time when the French and the British and the Italians were scrambling for the rest of it. And those people are not Christians, they're not Amharas, they are a variety of races of which the predominant one is the Romos. And this many in the south, in the in south. The south. Yeah. and many of those are in fact Muslims. I think probably the majority are Muslim, not Christians. They're also African, purely African, much more similar to people in Kenya and Uganda than um, the Amharas or the Eritreans, for that matter, who have got Hermetic and Semitic blood in them as well as African blood. So those people are totally different racially. Now, at the end of the Second World War, the, the whole situation was really up for grabs. And you had the French, um, the little place at the top there, Djibouti, that was, that was um, in fact, um, French. French Somaliland, 
and then the northern part of Somalia was British Somaliland and the southern was Italian Somaliland and what happened at the end of the Second World War is that the Somali nation was broken up you had Djibouti eventually emerging in 67 northern and southern Somalia were um, made into one country part of the Somali population is in Kenya and part are in Ethiopia in what we call the Ogaden so there you've got the genesis of a racial problem. We're talking about racial problems, yes, national indeed. problems. I mean, what, now in South Sudan you've got another problem, which is that there is the people in the South, as I think somebody said, are Africans, and in the North they really are Arabs. Hmm. And I they were they, they were taken separately. They were one yes. colony, but they were ruled separately. For example, the British didn't allow the Arabs to settle in South Sudan. Uh, okay, let me try and let me try and pose, if I mm. can, Mary, the question in a slightly different way. I mean, I think I think we've we've touched and we've discussed in in some detail yes. the 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 ethnic and other internal differences that you, you were describing very well there, if, if I may say so. The, the question that was in my mind was really this. Prior to the revolution in 1974, it was the Western Bloc that supported the Ethiopian government of, of Haile Selassie. After the revolution, it be, there was a switch around in the Horn of Africa, and the Soviet Bloc supported Haile Selassie. There are also... Uh, sorry, uh, Mengistu Rafi, yes, yes, the, the, the Ethiopian government of the, of the time. There are also suggestions that, for example, um, it, the, the, Arab, the, the, the conflict between the Arab world and Israel sees some resonance here in, in the sense that there is Israeli support for the, for the present government based on rail politics. Now, what, what, I'm, what I'm wondering is I'm wondering how all these external uh, conflicts have a bearing upon the people of Ethiopia and Tigray and Eritrea and how that affects the aid business. I think certainly they do have an effect and um, I once saw a poster in Eritrea which said you know blast the Italians, blast the British, blast the Ethiopians, they should all get out and I think one of the problems has been this perpetual interference which I also think from the Arab world has been very great and I'm, it's interesting to I keep hearing that Eritrea is Arab is predominantly Muslim tonight this is a, a very largely a figment of imagination of the Saudis <coughs> and others who would like to see another Islamic state in Eritrea which is not feasible because the people are 50-50 for example we talked about the highlands the highlands are predominantly occupied by Christians and they are I would think at least half the population so the idea of an Islamic state and an Arab identity is really not there. Um, so the interference has had a very great part in this. I think the Israelis have seen Ethiopia um, through the propaganda of the Ethiopians themselves and also through the propaganda of the Arabs as an expansion of Islam into, you know, preventing the expansion of Islam any further. But Islam is firmly installed in Ethiopia. I think probably half the population of Ethiopia without Eritrea are Muslim, so it's already there. But this is this is the propaganda of the Ethiopians. For example, I can tell you that I've over a period of time spoken to many hundreds of Ethiopian prisoners of war, and I would challenge this idea that this is the the war has unified unified the Amhara. Uh, many of these are Amharas, and the last thing that they wanted to do was to join that army and many of them defect and people are running away every day people arriving in Britain who are running away and who are Amharas who don't want to join this army and fight this war that is an absurd generalization about the Amharas they don't want the war they have tried not to do this but I've talked to these people many times and the only thing they understood about the war which had been told them by the political cadres every army unit has a political cadre brainwashing people was that they had gone to Eritrea to prevent an Arab invasion or to repel an Arab invasion and the most common comment was that when I came here we didn't find an Arab so you know this is all part of the propaganda system but it seems to me that you know we can sit here and talk to kingdom come and I believe that Brahani is right it is for the people to decide not just in Eritrea but in all the rest of these areas and just because the West to suit themselves either at the Treaty of Berlin or in, at the end of the Second World War decided to carve up places and say this is an entity, that is an entity, it doesn't mean that the Africans have to accept it. 
Right. Everything we've said today about Ethiopia and the Ethiopians, from the idea that they can be forcibly moved or that we should do this or we should do that, I have found very patronizing, very patronizing indeed, mm. as if they had no rights and not the same rights as ourselves to self-determination in whichever form they take it. Mary, in an ideal world, I mean, um, mm. the situation would be that the whole of Africa would be withdrawn. I mean, the, the Africa we know yeah. will not exist. But what, what, uh, what really sort of um, makes me very depressed is that mm. the, the will of the people, I respect that. And, and mm. It's a, a terribly Western idea, but never mind, let's apply it uh, into Africa. What are you going to have? It's, it's going to be chaotic. I if you start redrawing, I mean, it is going to be really chaotic. The reason why Eritrea would, uh, would not have a support or would never have a support of organizations like African Unity mm. and the United Nations is because they have got their own Eritrea in their backyard. Yes. Yeah. So basically, I mean, mm. what Except is going to be the solution for Eritrea and Ethiopia? But, but with the exception of Polisario, yeah. they haven't actually. This is not really correct. Um, Eritrea was an Italian colony. Nobody's mm. disputing that until 1941 during the Second World War. All the other Italian colonies were in fact decolonized, including Italian Somaliland. Um, and this is, I think, the difference between Eritrea and these other struggles, which have to be resolved some way, but may not be resolved in the same way, that in fact they have never been decolonized. The Eritreans are still a colonial nation under the Ethiopians. They went from the Italian, through the British military regime, to the, um, to the Ethiopians, so they haven't been decolonized. I don't think that's a good argument. But what is wrong, and you talked about Sri Lanka, and this is a classic example of imposing something on someone. What is wrong with having a large number of smaller units who formed into some economic union or even ultimately a political unit if they wanted it? Why do we have to have these large states which don't have the support of very large numbers of people in them? And where you've got diverse populations, it isn't just a question of culture, it's a question of nationality. You know, I think that there's a strong move in the EEC, for example, to depoliticize these struggles. We've seen recently in comments made in France and other places about the Kurds, for example, that they've got to have cultural rights. I don't want to be put off with people having cultural rights. People have a right to decide, I am an Eritrean, I am a Somali, whatever you are. And we've always had this right in Europe, and it has caused a lot of problems. But the problems are much greater if we interfere. We should not interfere with it. Let me say, let me say, let me say, let me say just, just one second. But, uh, it strikes me that, um, that we've covered an enormous amount of ground in our conversation this evening. I get the impression that we are coming to a natural conclusion. I don't think we've quite got there yet, but I get the impression that we're coming to a, to a natural conclusion. What I'd like to do as, as the program draws to a conclusion is to, if you like, raise two questions and then to go around the table and to ask each of you in turn to address the two questions that, that we're going to raise. We've, we've, we've traveled far and wide this evening, I think, in, in, in many different ways. We've talked about a oh, wide I'm range of, of <laughs> wide, in no uncertain terms. Uh, I'd like to take us back to aid, and I'd like to take us back to where we started, the press release that, Berhani, you released a few days ago, uh, warning of an impending famine in, in Eritrea and in, in other parts of northern Ethiopia. How can we actually learn from the mistakes that we've made in the past? How can the public do something when they see pictures on television screens over the weeks to come? And what will you be doing, each of you in turn, personally, about aid in the weeks and months to come? Can we start with you, Mark? Oh, goodness. Uh, <coughs> First off, I mean, I think that, that, as I said, addressing the issues of famine uh, are, in a sense, depoliticizing it, which, which I think we've discussed at, at great length. I mean, the, the issue that remains for us as, a, as, as an agency is the fact that the UN uh, and uh, international law has not been sufficiently strong to step into these uh, highly politicized areas to say people have the basic right to food, whatever, and we must try and find the mechanism to guarantee that. You know, and we, we fought shy of that. Uh, I mean, the UN, I think, uh, a special representative in Ethiopia fought shy of that. I mean, fought, fought
course, how taking the Ethiopian government on on those issues. Uh, and it, it wasn't tackled with, with the other parties invol involved either. And it is a major problem, I mean, outside Ethiopia, it's a major problem in areas such as southern Sudan at the moment, which I think is about to face, or will, may face some problems. It's certainly a problem in Somalia. It, it's a problem in Angola. It's a problem in Mozambique. I mean, Africa is, is, is full of sort of bushfire wars, which, which are ill-defined, not conventional wars for which our legislative processes were written in the 1940s or whatever. And we, we haven't got the mechanisms to provide assistance to people in that. So I think that's, that's one of the things that I think needs to be addressed. And I think needs to be addressed by the UN system, which I think has become, in my view, flabby over the last 20 years uh, and, and not there to address the rights of, 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 of individuals. What should, indiv what should people do over the next few weeks and months if Berhani's worst fears come true? Well, I think that, that you know, I mean, unfortunately, because many governments were caught hopping in 1984, that the government will, I mean, governments will respond, and I think that, you know, one might say that the UN system is flagging a famine, just to make sure that people do respond by pressurizing their government to give aid or whatever, and that they will ignore the longer-term solutions that are, that are required. So actually doing something in the next two or three months, albeit laudable and necessary, I mean, uh, you know, is not going to solve the sort of problems. They need to think towards the long term. And I think they need to remember that also that famine in Ethiopia is a recurrent problem. It's a recurrent problem in large parts of Africa. And that just because you've done something once doesn't mean you solve the problem. And what I don't see is any sort of working towards the longer term solutions for which the international framework has to be redefined. Berhani, do you see any movement towards long-term solutions? Um, yes, well, I hope, uh, rather than I see. Uh, but uh, as I have uh, put it on my uh, press release, which has been sent out from inside the NPR to us, that we have raised this matter now a month ago, and it is an early warning system, and I don't like it to happen. What, what, what it has happened in 1984. So what I could say is, uh, be it NGOs na or non-governmental non organizations like Save the Children Fund and uh, others would come forward uh, to raise funds, at the same time raise awareness to the public properly by explaining the problem within Ethiopia and Eritrea, and also by uh, asking the right uh, and true uh, aid in a way that without uh, impending others, uh, while uh, in Eritrea, in some part of Eritrea is serving and only uh, putting yourself into legitimate government, we are going to work with the legitimate government. There are other alternatives, the cross-border operation from Port Sudan, for which the Eritrean Relief Association is very much actively uh, working, which sustains the lives of 650,000 people every year. So your message, in a sense, to Mark would be don't work through the Ethiopian government, come through us direct? Yes, unlikely, uh, uh, unfortunately, they're not working uh, now, and uh, we would, would we'd like to pledge to them to, to work through the Eritrean Relief Association. I'm not also against not working uh, through the other side. If there are people who are starving within the Ethiopian held territory, they have to be supported. And at the same time, through, uh, through the Eritrean Relief Association, whereby uh, they cannot be reached through the Ethiopian government held area. So I am looking at things that it is a humanitarian work. It's, it's, it shouldn't be uh, mixed with politics or also one has not just uh, uh, say the civil children fund for example, and um, just thinking for example, shouldn't fear that uh, we should only work through the sovereign country. And uh, I very much hope that everybody will uh, share this view with me and uh, to direct uh, the food aid before the catastrophic uh, situation arises. Mary, do you think we've learned from mistakes at all? No, not yet, and I hope that we can. <coughs> I think the shoes mentioned short and long term. In the short term, there is the question of the people in Eritrea and Tigray um, to be fed. And one of the long-term things we have a look, look at is has a direct bearing on this, and this is the role of non-governmental organizations. 
And I really think that one of the problems is that non-governmental organizations has now become part of governmental systems at both ends. For example, organization on, in the UK receive grants from the British government and they can only be distributed in certain ways. And at the other end, you're working under the constraints of the Ethiopians or the Somalis, whoever. And I would like to see a complete division between the, the question of non-governmental organizations and official aid. And because of the way that they're working, particularly in this part of the world, we have seen, we mentioned South Sudan, but there has been a famine in South Sudan and very many hundreds of deaths also caused by war. And one of the tragedies of that particular thing was that the non-governmental organizations who were working in northern Sudan as a result of the floods and various other things were unable to help those people because the South Sudanese government didn't want them to and they were frightened of being kicked out of the north. And we have to find some way in which there is a genuine non-governmental organization which can assist people when there's a need, a sort of fire brigade. Are you hope? I hope so because people are going to see these things happening again and again and we are unable to reach people. It's a shame and a disgrace that in fact the truth about South Sudan has never actually come out publicly. But that's because there was no one working there and there weren't television cameras and so forth. One step further than that um, is the whole question of the solution to the national questions in Africa and I still insist that these have to be addressed both by the United Nations and by groups of countries in the areas concerned. And the Carter Initiative is a small thing. I personally don't think it will succeed because I don't think the Ethiopian government is actually facing the, the reality at the moment. But it also won't succeed because unlike Angola and Afghanistan, you haven't actually got Soviet participation in it. So you've got one power in it and one power out of it. So I would hope that we don't leave it to the Americans and Russians. Who are they to tell the Africans how they live? This, to me, is outrageous. But there would be some form of system in the UN where all this business about sovereignty based on purely arbitrary colonies set up by other people in the past can be <coughs> investigated and some sort of solution found. And I don't think the UN is worth having unless it does that. Because if you look at the conflicts and you look at the refugees that are all over the world, with very few exceptions, these are about this whole question of people being stuck in states in which they are without their will, and this has to be looked at. Abadi Zemo, do you think, do you expect to see a time when that problem is looked at? And, uh, before going to that, actually, now what uh, I want to say is now, uh, let's look at the current situation and then try to see what another solution could be. Uh, from my point of view, I say that you know, the situation of 1984-85 is very different from that of the present situation. Politically, the government is not in a position to, co to control whatsoever part of Tigray, as it was controlling in 1984-85. Not only in Tigray, but in all in Gondor area, the adjacent provinces. Most of these, these territories are now under the full control and administration of the Tigray People's Liberation Front and the Ethiopian People's Democratic Movement. An alliance is formed by these two political organizations. A new alliance, a new front called Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front. This is a front which is controlling most of the, this area, that of Gondar and World Area. Then, this is the current situation when it comes to the political reality. When it comes to the other aspect, that is not the solution for the problem. This newly formed front and the two members of this front, they are saying that no, let's stop the war. Let's sit and discuss and try to solve the problem peacefully. In order to solve the problem, let's look at the political cause there are different political organizations with different political aspirations, with different political outlooks. Regardless of their outlooks, let's invite them and form a provisional government whereby they could exercise their democratic rights. They could go to any part of Ethiopia 
and address and organize the people of Ethiopia. Let the people of Ethiopia, let the people of Ethiopia be aware which party or front represents what. And then finally, it would be up to the people of Ethiopia to decide what sort of system <coughs> they need, which party they need to be on the government. Then, you know, this is one, you know, the, from the political side. This is completely different from that of 1984-85. Which about? Then, the, well, uh, the point, you know, in the other aspect, the relief operation. Before, you know, 1984-85, organizations like SF or World Division, they are saying that, you now they have to do this and that through that area. But now, when there is no government presence in Tigran, we feel that, you no, know, it's only through the relief site of Tigray that the people of Tigray could be supported. No other channel at present. Because there is no presence whatsoever of the Ethiopian government in Tigray. And in fact, in most northern parts of Ethiopia, including Gondar and Warlo. So there is no an excuse, there is no excuse whatsoever to channel any kind of aid assistance through the Ethiopian government. It should be channeled through the organizations like the Relief Site of Tigray, which is working in Tigray, and the Ethiopian Relief Organization, which is working in Gondar and Warlo area. These are the two organizations who could reach the people, who could provide the assistance which is going to be channeled through the inter I mean, from the international community. This is what I feel mm -hmm. that now has to be realized and should be implemented. Richard. Well, I, I first went to Ethiopia in 83 during an well, African tour and I came back and a num with a number of other people who went separately but around that time said to the European communities, a famine is coming. It was quite evident by then. The West chose to turn its back on it because it was embarrassed. That's already been said. Since then, the European communities has put a thousand million dollars into Ethiopia in one way or another. The UK official aid program is, of course, nil, which reflects the political priorities. But the UK has contributed generously to the food aid program in Ethiopia as well. We're now being asked to basically cough up another thousand million. At the same time, there's been a war going on. There's no munitions industry in Ethiopia or the Sudan. All of that war has been financed for their own reasons by countries from outside the region who have seen something to be gained from instability in the Horn of Africa. Whether it's backing the southern Sudanese or the Eritreans or the Tigrayans, there's no big munitions factories turning it out, and those weapons are not raised by having jumble sales on a Saturday morning in Asmara. They're raised because of cynical manipulation by the West. Now, I am worried and concerned that the, the balkanization aspect, increasingly, in fact, as tension decreases between East and West, we're seeing the rise of nationalism again, not only in Africa, but all over Europe. One of the most corrosive forces there is. People just go out, they have their nationalist aspiration. That's why I believe in federalism, because I believe it is a corrosive force. The best hope we have at the moment is the Carter Peace Initiative. He was a very underrated American president. He is someone who genuinely cares. I believe that the Soviet Union is quite prepared to play a part in this. All the signs I get are that, of course, the Soviets would like to have an involvement, but they don't necessarily want a front-line involvement. What they want is a demilitarization and a way out because there's nothing for Moscow in Addis. It's taken many years for them to realize that. And I think that what we have to look for is that. And, you know, frankly, playing politics with people's lives by saying they can send in food this way into Tigray or they can send it in that way into Eritrea, what we've got to do is to get the food there. And what I would ask, and this question was never answered straightly, Rebecca answered the question, do we support the Carter Initiative or not? I would say there is no way forward, and I agree with Rebecca here, unless, for the Horn of Africa, unless we give full-hearted support and look for a solution and stop, basically, as I say, playing politics with people's lives. Peter. Is it a Carter initiative, by the way? I take a slightly different view of the situation. Uh, I think I have two things I'd like to say. One refers to official aid, the other the vol voluntary, uh, non-governmental organization. The first, uh, I would like to see the aid, uh, the British aid program substantially reformed and that the criterion of aid should not be the basis 
of the income, per capita income in the recipient countries because that directly rewards policies of impoverishment or even immiseration, if I may use a Marxist term, that the, uh, the lower the income, the more the government can, uh, can qualify for aid. If you expel the most productive minorities or maltreat them, you reduce per capita incomes, you qualify for more aid. If you restrict the employment opportunities for women, you reduce per capita income, you qualify for more aid. I would like to see the criteria of allocation of all Western aid, naturally including British aid, to be substantially reformed and to be geared not to the income in the recipient countries, but to the policy, overall policies of the recipient government, and give it to governments which by humane leadership, efficient administration, and extension of personal freedom, promote the welfare of their people and, and economic progress. I would like, I said before, that I were or on the record too many years ago, such is my age, of favoring the voluntary organizations. I've slightly backtracked from this, although my basic position remains as before. But I think in the last 10 or 15 years, there has been such a rapid expansion in non-governmental agencies that there are a lot of people in the, on the staffs there who haven't enough experience and sensitivity to work across cultural frontiers. That is one of the problems of rapid expansion. Another one is that because they have grown so large, they now have to depend on what they can or cannot do so much on the consent or accept by the, by the local governments that they are not allowed, can't operate as freely as they did before. Third, there are also many of the large charities have become heavily politicized and are more concerned with political aims, objectives, rather than with direct relief of need. And also, they have become too involved, too, too closely linked to the official aid organizations. I would like to see that trend reversed to have smaller and more sensitive non-governmental agencies less exposed to political pressures, less interested in political objectives. These, and I have a feeling that this would, not next year or year after, but eventually help Ethiopia also. Charles, do you, do you find some resonance with what Peter's saying? I don't know. I, I think we've failed. We, we, the rich countries, have failed Ethiopia in the most dramatic way. Um, Ethi Ethiopia is sliding down um, into, re into greater and greater poverty. Ethiopia will shortly have a food deficit in a normal year of a million tons. So Ethiopia, each successive year, is less able to feed itself. And it's less able to feed itself because of a variety of problems, but, it, but, but very soon it will have a structural deficit. That, that means in a normal year it will produce, be producing a million tons less than it needs to feed the people. So in any aberrant year, in any year where there's drought, it will increase. And in 1984, a million tons is what it needed. So that will need that every year. And I think we've failed to look at Ethiopia's problems, and Ethiopia's problems is one of, problem is one of poverty. Farmers there, the farmers we saw, the farmers that Malcolm and I filmed, the, these people are using tools that go back a thousand years, and they're farming in a way that they haven't, that hasn't changed. And it, we need, the West, the rich country, the less we in the rich countries in the world can actually embrace the poorer countries and actually give them some of the things they need. I mean, we give them food, but food doesn't feed, food disappears as soon as it's eaten. There's no residual benefit. And I think for the people of Ethiopia, from all that tremendous 
feeling of generosity from the people throughout the world. And I don't think it came from governments, it came from the people. The governments were pushed by the people. From the residue from that is very, very small, minuscule. And, it, and until we embrace that, and I would even think that perhaps Ethiopia will never be able to feed itself, but it could be a manufacturing country. There's a vast um, um, population who are um, very resilient, resourceful, intelligent, uh, and have a lot to offer the world. But the world is, some, has, is refusing to help them. We, are, we still, they are at the bottom of the league in development aid. And it's only tremendous development and concern and long-standing uh, concern that can say, do anything for the people. And that concern perhaps would, would enable the conflicts to disappear. Ethiopia is a confederation of states. I think there are 87 languages spoken in Ethiopia. It's, it's sort of, in a way, uh, wrong to think of Ethiopia as a country any more than you'd say United Kingdom as a country. In the United Kingdom we have several different ethnic groups and peoples that, that have their own identity, but manage to survive together without being in open hostility uh, to each other. And they do that because of, there's an economic benefit and people have there is a sense of well-being and people, people can see that there are things in there that work for them. People, we do not expect our children to die of starvation. In Ethiopia, people expect their children to die from starvation. In Ethiopia, in the place we come from, we would be in, if, if a woman has twins, they die. The, a woman does not get enough food to sustain twins, they die, invariably and always. And that is a terrible, terrible thing. Most people expect two of their children to die before they reach the age of 12. So, and we have the ability to change this. We have the money, we have the resources, we have the ingenuity, we have the technical uh, expertise to help the people. And they do not have whatever, have whatever can, what, however they're fighting, whatever is going on, they cannot do it by themselves because they don't have the financial resources to buy the technology and buy their way out of it. And all we can do, or we should, what we should be doing, is providing that, that bed of resources that's necessary. And unless we do, Ethiopia will become poorer and poorer and poorer. Rebecca, do you see the country becoming poorer and poorer and poorer, or do you see it well, it's, crawling its way away down. from the... It is going down, and my plea um, to all the people here and, and in Ethiopia is that during the next year when another famine is going to hit us, um, think about the people. Forget about politics. I mean, what is the use of um, gaining independence if you have no population left? I agree with um, Mark that uh, famine has to be depoliticized. Um, the Tigray um, Liberation Front are saying, give aid to us. We control the country. Fine, you control the country, just let the aid go through. Um, I, don't, I think in the past, both sides have used famine as a weapon. And, I, and the tragedy is, I mean, if there was a Nobel uh, Prize for suffering, I think the, the people of that region would get it, doing it every year. And I think it's about time that suffering stopped. Rebecca, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very, very much indeed. I think that was, uh, I'm afraid there's no more points to be made because we've all gone round the table and it would be desperately unfair about it if I let you make one last point and not everybody else. So let me draw our conversation to a close and, and let me say once again thank you very much indeed. I think we covered the ground in a, in a, a terrific fashion and I think everybody had a very fair say and I think uh, we perhaps threw some light on the problems of Ethiopia this evening. Maybe we didn't come to any conclusions, but I think it was a, a fascinating conversation. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you for staying with us. And uh, after dark is back next Saturday. Join us then. Good night. Absolutely.
you'd like to appear on a future After Dark programme, the address to write to is After Dark, P.O. Box 4000, London W36XJ. That's After Dark, P.O. Box 4000, London W36XJ. Or you can telephone the number in the TV Times. Please tell us a little about yourself and the issue you'd like to talk about. I'm going to go to the hospital. 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 I'm going